by you checking in on the chat stream of where you are from and what you're hoping to get out of the event today. Let's get started. Well, Randy, it's great to be back here again this year for our UPRT Safety Summit. Why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself to the folks as one of the hosts today. Hello, it's great to be here today. I'm Randall Brooks. I'm the Executive Vice President for Flight Operations at Aviation Performance Solutions. Oh, we got a great lineup here, Randy, of great speakers. I know everybody's been looking at the agenda. We have our keynote by United Airlines. Uh, we have one topic on the Every Pilot and Control Solution Standard. Then we have a great mix of airline speakers, simulator uh, manufacturers, insurance agencies, corporate flight department, and chief pilots, and even an industry leader uh, wrapping up you know, here with John Cox on session seven. But I think the last event here, session eight, is going to be very interesting that you're going to be hosting. Do you want to talk about that a little bit before we go over to Danny? Yeah, I hope everybody is uh, writing down their questions and keeping track of things that uh, might not be answered during the event. Our last session will be a wrap-up. We'll have as many of our guest speakers joining us as possible, and we hope that you'll be here to ask us your questions at that time. All right. Without further ado, let's go ahead and get going with the keynote. I'll see you in the event, Randy. Great. I have the honor and privilege of introducing our keynote speaker today, Captain Danny Hall with United Airlines. Danny's current position is Senior Manager Aviation. and JetBlue Airways. Danny joined United Airlines in the 737 with over 4,000 hours on type. As a flight instructor, he held the positions of Boeing 737, 737 MAX return to service subject matter expert, training center evaluator, and part 142 certificate manager. Manager flight training for the Boeing 737 and United Airlines Contract Training Center Certificate Manager. And he was the team lead to develop training and standardization content for the very impressive and really world leading academy, United Aviate Academy. Danny spends his free time with his wife traveling, hiking, running, skiing, and flying gliders. And just last week, they welcomed a brand new, beautiful baby boy to their family. Over the past year, working together with Danny to develop training solutions with the United Aviate Academy, he's demonstrated himself to be an expert leader and a true technical expert, and I consider him a close friend. Danny, with that, over to you, sir. Hey, BJ. Thank you for the introduction, and thank you for letting me kick off this year's Safety Summit. I want to commend you and your team on your efforts and laser focus on safety. And to all of you watching out there, and or watching after the summit, thank you for taking the time to listen and participate in this year's safety summit. Before I go on, I wanna establish a few ground rules. Standard pilot, right? First and foremost, I'm very passionate about aviation and sometimes that comes out in many diatribes. So thanks for humoring me, humoring me, excuse me, on my diatribes. Second, I can't promise that I won't bore you half to death. However, I'll try to keep it faster or funnier. And uh, lastly, I'm not going to say anything that's too fancy or cosmic, 
Uh, in fact, my goal is to harp on aviation core competencies with a little twist. Those core competencies, I think, are extremely valuable as we look a year, two years, three years down the road uh, in our current aviation, uh, the current aviation industry and the challenges that we foresee. Those core competencies are safety, quality, and back to basics. I told you, they're not gonna be cosmic. Let's start this off with safety. And I wanna first foremost say that this isn't gonna be your mother or father's safety talk. In fact, I'm gonna assume that by the mere fact that you are tuning in to today, you're well-versed in safety and all of the buzzwords associated with safety in aviation. What I do wanna discuss and can't wait for the follow on questions uh, and the collaboration is, I wanna discuss making safety cool. And what I mean by that is traditionally, we've treated safety through PowerPoints at the beginning of your aviation career, through graphs and charts and numbers, through posters up on a wall, through recurrent training, you get a little safety blurb, and then every week, or every month, you get a safety email. However, that's not cutting it. And the data suggests that we don't have full buy-in from our pilots. One of the ways I think that we can get as close to full buy-in as possible is making safety cool. And that's a sweet buzzword and I get it. But what I mean by making safety cool is, is let's put a twist on safety from the very beginning. Let's make sure that safety is integrated throughout our pilot ecosystem. I'm not saying completely replace all of the PowerPoints and the posters and the charts and the graphs and the data. That is important, especially for pilots. We have to be able to speak to all demographics. However, let's intertwine safety from the very beginning, from BI. We have the, the safety discussions, the the knowledgeable, or excuse me, the, uh, the educational PowerPoint briefs on safety. But then throughout basic NDOC, let's incorporate safety and bring up how effective safety is when we're all working together. And we think about safety throughout our training, big or small. That'll dovetail nicely and transition nicely into qualification training. Qualification, there's a lot of opportunity to discuss safety and qualification training that Maybe we think right now we don't have time for it, but we do have time for it. We do have time to show while we're in qual training where there were some safety of flight issues. What happens if we do encounter safety of flight issues? And let's make that part of our, our debrief is a safety, a discussion on safety. And then lastly, through recurrent training, let's incorporate not just a standard safety brief. Let's talk about where we're going with safety. Let's talk about how each individual can improve in safety. Same thing with academies and pilot training. Safety is in everything that we do and it's a core fundam fundamental of a flight academy. It's also a core fundamental of a student pilot's training. So let's make it fun, let's make it cool, all right? And I, I I'll end with this, years ago, 20, 30 years, basic NDOC was tedious. It was boring, right? It, we were talking about HR related uh, issues, meaning your, your uh, health benefits, travel benefits, uh, the FOM, flight operations manual is what we call it at United. That was boring. Years ago at United, we looked at basic NDOC and said, let's make this cool. So I challenge the industry that if we can make basic NDOC cool, we can make our number one core competency in the aviation industry, which is safety, we can make that cool as well. And hopefully, we'll, I guarantee you throughout the Safety Summit, there will be a lot of specifics there in addition to what I said, and a lot of cool things that some companies are coming up with to include dynamic or phase-based ORM tools, that really truly bring in the pilots. I'm sure we're gonna talk about that. And if not, love to talk about it during the Q&A. But again, let's make safety cool.
we'll talk about the, that a little bit later. The second topic is quality. And I, I'm, I'm a little concerned, I'm nervous about the current challenges uh, in the aviation industry and what that's going to do to the quality of our training programs. Right now, the challenge is, is we're all, all the operators, the industry is competing for the same pilot group. And then we're also looking forward to understanding that we're going to need more pilots and we need to produce pilots at a record pace. Sometimes that need for efficient pilot training is at the expense of quality pilot training. We've all heard the term, those, the pilot factories of the world. I do not want the aviation industry to turn into a pilot factory. I think that we need to re, we need to focus our efforts on a quality program. And I'll take it up a notch and say that if you have a quality program, it can be just as efficient, if not more efficient, than a pilot factory program. So what do I mean by quality pilot training program? Well, first and foremost, we need to ensure that quality training is in our pilot training. I think it's broken down into three phases of the training quality syllabus, quality instructor training, and then a quality assurance program, quality, quality assurance program. Allow myself to say quality twice in one sentence. First and foremost, I think the a syllabus, we, we, you need to put a lot of thought into a syllabus. Depending on what you're trying to tra train, excuse me, the academy level or a, 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 a uh, flight academy level, qualification course at an airline or somewhere in between, there is not a cookie cutter approach to a syllabus. I think each operator needs to look at the syllabus and doing what's right for the student. Making sure that it is flexible enough to, if the student is not learning effectively, to go back and retrain or focus in a different area to better suit that pilot and truly create that adult learning centric program. So one of the ways, at least I'll, I'll, I'm a little biased, but I'll harp on what we're doing down at United Aviate Academy when it comes to our syllabus. First and foremost, our syllabus is military style training. We, um, our students truly buckle down eat, sleep, breathe, and focus on flying while they're down uh, in Goodyear at, our, uh, at the United Aviate Academy. It's a structured 141 program. We take the bare minimum 141 structure and the TCO, and we have unitedized it. We have harmonized our SOPs with Big Mother United so that the quality of training that the student is receiving from day one is that of United, and it's the exact same BI, CRM, TEM, callouts, procedures, et cetera, that they will uh, have when they get to United. We also have a robust quality assurance program that takes the feedback that we're receiving from the students and instructors and feeds it back into the program so that we can fine tune the program to make sure that it is quality. It's what we expect at United. It continues to be industry leading and it's focused on what the students need. The second part of ensuring a quality program is instructor training. I don't think I need to really go into the specifics of why we need instructor training with this group. Uh, I will just share a quick background or example uh, to, to support the instructor training, the quality instructor training um, theory. And that is uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was down at Randolph Air Force Base. Uh, I had the honor and privilege to speak with and uh, receive a few briefings from the pilot training next detachment down at Randolph. And throughout their brief, they were very good about disclosing their lessons learned from their three to five years of building up this Pilot Training Next program that has a lot of great, great initiatives and some very cool things that uh, we could talk about later and hopefully that we adapt, adopt, excuse me, as an industry. One of those 
the number one lesson learned, the number one lesson learned that the Air Force passed on to us was the requirement, was the fundamental requirement for quality instructors. And that started with quality instructor training. You have to ensure that our instructors are properly trained, they are standardized, and they understand their purpose. I think that we all understand that as instructors at the lower level at the academy, your goal is to get flight time. We need to make sure that instructors understand that their instructors, that they're for there for the student first. And we need to make sure that they understand their purpose. And I think that that comes through properly uh, setting proper expectations, uh, adequate, or excuse me, and then properly trained instructors, standardized training, and increased communication. All right, last but not least, under the quality paragraph is a quality assurance program. Think an ability to adequately evaluate, observe your program to make sure that it's meeting the needs of your pilot and your organization. But then also take that data, take that observation and be able to feed it back into the, the pilot training machine so that you can now reap the benefits of, that, of those observations or those efficiencies, uh, that feedback throughout your program. And again, beefing up the quality uh, of, your, of your syllabus and of your program. To include, and I'll end on this, to include the QA program needs to look at the instructor training program and also QC the and quality uh, check the uh, instructors. And I, I believe, I truly do believe that through quality training and standardization, you can replace less flight time and experience through the old adage of you can teach experience. And that teaching of experience comes through your quality instructors, your syllabus that is above and beyond the minimums that, that's been thought through and, it's, and it prepares the student correctly. And then your QA program that takes the, the feedback and creates that feedback loop. The third thing that I wanna to talk to before, I hopefully, hopefully tie all this into uh, upset training fluency is I want, I, I encourage the industry and encourage everyone to go back to the basics. Again, this is a topic that I don't think I really need to harp on the whys with this group, but if we don't have fundamentally sound pilots entering our industry, then we as an industry are not fundamentally sound. I think we can all agree throughout our phases of training and our, and our career that if you aren't a fundamentally sound pilot, regardless of all the automation, regardless of the SOPs, regardless of the experience level of who you were flying with, there was a real safety issue. There, was a, there, was, there were problems. Right? Because I think we all know that when the automation fails or when your flying partner isn't up to the task that day uh, or just something happens, most of the time you have to rely on your basic piloting skills. At the United Aviate Academy, it, one of the questions from the uh, instructors, the check airmen down at the academy, uh, the, the chief of standardization, the chief pilot, I always ask, hey, Danny, how do we harmonize with United? How do we instill CRM, TEM basics with a private pilot student when they can't even land? And I said, that's simple. We prioritize the basics first. We want to create sound pilots first. That's our focus, depending on their phase. Private pilot, instrument, we wanna create sound, fundamentally sound pilots. Once we get into the commercial phase and we start to throw in some different scenarios, some commercial style scenarios, hopefully they have those, that, those the fundamentals 
established to where we can build on their, their basics, their flying uh, aptitude. One quick back to the basic story. As I was showing up in theater to one of my first uh, deployments to Afghanistan, the outgoing squadron always briefs the incoming squadron on lessons learned. And I'll never forget that the outgoing squadron briefed us their number one lesson learned, which was don't forget the basics. All of their issues actually stemmed from the pilot getting enamored with the Gucci new technology and forgetting basic fundamental principles, switchologies, switchology, excuse me, communication, um, certain uh, steps in the combat chain. And almost zero, almost zero of the lessons learned were tied to the technology or what we call the, the Gucci, like I said earlier, the Gucci um, stuff that we can do with the jet. And again, that ties to me, I think about that constantly when I see an organization or a person trying to get too enamored with the technology. I could see our industry and our academies getting too enamored with trying to create airline pilots with too much technology or too much reliance on the Gucci stuff and not focusing first on the basics and ensuring that pilot falls back and understands on the basics. All right, so of safety, quality, and back to the basics, A, I told you I wasn't gonna say anything new or cosmic, just a little twist on those. How does making safety cool, quality training, and back to the basics tie into upset training fluency. Well, I believe that upset training encompasses all three topics through the comprehensive and dynamic environment that provides our pilots with an enormous value for not only themselves, but their follow-on operators. At the United Aviate Academy, we have incorporated upset training in the syllabus down at Goodyear uh, after their instrument check ride, but before their commercial check ride, because we feel that it is the right thing to do. It is again back to that quality piece where it is the, the it's it's not just the bare minimums. It it adds to the footprint, but it creates enormous value for the pilot and follow on operators. We've implemented uh, UPRT down at UAA, like I said, after their instrument check ride, but before their commercial check ride. And we work through APS. Right now we have, they go out to APS's headquarters. They go through six plus hours of ground school. They have a three ride on aircraft training and they finish it off with a capstone sim. I mean, let's just think about that for a second. Think about when we were all training and we were in our commercial phase. If somebody said to us, hey, pause, go off and take this world-class industry leading, the gold standard training and go through that, that, that type of training, what do you think it would, it would do for you? Well, I think we can agree that it would make you a very safe pilot. It, by safe, meaning it addresses the leading cause of aviation fatalities, not just in North America, but worldwide, and brings it to focus through advanced ground school, right? On aircraft training, where it's not just a simulator, they're in the aircraft. They have air under them. They are seeing, smelling, feeling, flying in all types of environment all types of phases, excuse me, in the envelope. And then they go into the sim, and now with that, with those fundamental skills and that knowledge base, they top it off with a capstone sim. Think about if you, if we had that, or if you had that during your training, how much better you would just be as a pilot, educated in flying skills, right? Not only that, you add in the decision-making skills that 
upset prevention and recovery training gives you, the hand flying skills, the confidence, that is just all an enormous value. And that speaks to the quality of the training. And one that I think safety and quality are paramount, right? And it's something that you can, it, that is embedded in upset prevention and recovery training. I think that in and of itself is a huge uh, argument and the basis for why we need to increase the awareness and the uh, requirements for upset prevention training moving forward. When we talk about safety programs, quality training, and training that focuses on back to the basics, I encourage and dare I say challenge national aviation authorities to recognize quality training that is proactive and demonstrates risk mitigation of loss of control in flight, like upset prevention training, through increased credits towards certain pilot milestones, such as the 1500 hour rule, ATP, CTP, et cetera. Again, based off of a quality training program. I hit on making safety cool, ensuring quality, and then all of us need to go back to the basics and why I believe why upset prevention and recovery training truly capitalizes and is the epitome of those three competencies. I thank you all for your time. Uh, I hope my first rule, which was, I won't make it too boring. I think it was my second rule. Hopefully it wasn't too boring. It was faster or funnier. I appreciate everybody's time. And I also, again, want to emphasize my thanks to BJ and his team and also to everybody watching. Uh, I look forward to uh, more dialogue, collaboration throughout this summit, and also follow on collaboration as we continue to, to, to chat and talk about uh, how we mitigate the, the threats and the challenges moving forward. So again, thanks for letting me kick this off, BJ. And now back to you for questions. Danny, thank you for that very insightful presentation today. I thought that was great. Really appreciate your time for being here. So one final question, since we only have about a minute left. Do you feel like the United Aviate Academy is on the track of transforming low experience into high aviation safety? All right. So in a minute or less, you're saying no diatribes. Okay. So the short answer, uh, BJ, is yes. Uh, I think that if you look at how we've structured the academy through our uh, military style training, robust training, we've gone above and beyond the 141 requirements with our TCO. We've harmonized our SOPs with the United Airlines to include call outs, procedures, briefs, debriefing cards. That's right. They debrief. Um, and CRM, TEM skills and basics from the very, very beginning. I mean, that we've enculturated them uh, from day one. And of course, last but certainly not least, is we provide them upset prevention recovery training on aircraft training early on in their career to, to build on those fundamentally sound core competencies of pilots that are making them safe, quality, right, training program, and back to the basics. Perfect. Well, thank you, Danny. We're out of time. I really appreciate you coming here to join everybody here today. So I congratulate you, the United Aviate Academy, and all the hard work you're doing, and everybody's going to benefit, not just the people on the call today, but I think the industry at large because of the hard work you guys are doing. So thank you, sir, for being here, and thank you, everybody, for joining us for today's event. Thank you.
Thank you, Randy, for that great introduction. We're just excited to get going on this topic, the Every Pilot and Control Solutions Standard. With that, before we get started, Otter, why don't you say hi to everybody out there today? Well, greetings, everyone. It's great to be with you. Thanks, BJ. Uh, looking forward to this uh, discussion right. on this topic. Well, let's just jump right into it. Real quick, who is APS? We're hoping to gain a little bit of credibility as we get started here. Well, our purpose is we help pilots bring everyone home safely, and our mission is very apt to the presentation today. It's to crush the threat of loss of control on flight globally by partnering with safety champions to accelerate the adoption of life-saving APS upset training. I think the three key elements in there are highlighted, crushing this threat, which is completely unnecessary in our judgment, but also doing that by partnering with safety champions around the world. You're going to meet some of our partners here in just a minute to implement life-saving APS upset training. Because we have 30 years experience implementing this, we know exactly what it takes, how to do it on all levels of aviation. And we want to freely share that with the industry today through this concept called the Every Pilot in Control Solution Standard. Uh, with that said, our brand promises every pilot trained in control all the time. Here's our brand new facility that we got uh, installed last year. It uh, is two facilities. The one on the right is our main facility right now. It is truly designed to be the nexus of UPRT excellence, all in one location. We have academic classrooms. We have on-aircraft piston, on-aircraft jet, advanced simulation and seven classes of airplane and virtual reality and mixed reality all in one location. So it really has been designed to give the most effective, most comprehensive solution to overcoming the threat of loss of control in flight uh, in the world. And that's what we're really proud about. And those methods and processes are what we're going to talk about today. But I would like to invite everybody, if you want to pause the video, if you're watching the recording or take a screenshot now, I invite you, if you're ever in Arizona, to come and see us. We'd love to get you up for an evaluation, even if that's just a short tour. Depending on the size of your organization, we can get you up in an airplane, show you what we do and how we do it. There is no charge for that. So please take us up on that offer. You can get there by going to that URL or that QR code and submitting an, uh, a request and a form that will get you uh, to our team. So. A few of our partners, we're really excited about these safety champions that we partner with around the world that help us to win on this threat of loss of control in flight. And they are progressive. They're doing it right. And we're excited to have them as part of our team. So let's talk about this threat of loss of control. You can see it represented by the big red column uh, there on the left. And the reality of it is, no matter how you look at aviation, different areas of aviation, whether that's general aviation, corporate executive, on-demand operations, or air carriers, you will see loss of control and flight dominating the fatal statistics. And in fact, it's not uncommon for it to be approximately equal to everything else combined. So this is a result of how the industry tra trains. And so a paradigm shift is required, and it's not going to happen by simply doing what we've been doing before under a different name, which is largely what's going on even today after guidance coming out in 2014 by ICAO, which we're gonna talk about a little bit more. So to accomplish the paradigm shift, not only do we need to have great guidance like ICAO has started, we also have to understand how to implement it with the most effectiveness. And that's what we're gonna talk about today with the Every Pilot in Control Solution Standard. So this particular graphic represents the concept that we're going to be discussing today. You're gonna to see that there's five pieces of pies starting with the instructor through integrated program, training intensity, best practices, purpose-built platforms, but it's wrapped on the outer rim by initial training and then framed on the inner rim by recurrent training, all leading to the center area, which is every pilot in control. Now, the great news is, in addition to our presentation today, you can go to that URL and you can download a booklet that explains it at a high level so you better understand what this is. Now, the question really is, why did we do this? We were part of the group that put together the guidance that came out with ICAO in 2014. It was 40 organizations, 80 experts around the world from 2009 through about 2013. And the guidance put out by ICAO that we're going to see on this next slide is really excellent. It's a great start. It does have some gaps, but at least it's on track for what it does. What we saw, though, the challenge was is a strong tendency for the industry to just simply do its very best to implement that largely in the way it was already addressing loss of control and flight, or as I said earlier, doing the same thing just under a different name instead of unusual attitude training, install training, just calling it upset prevention and recovery training and saying the intent 
of that guidance was accomplished. Well, that's not at all what needs to happen to implement an effective mitigation of loss of control. So we created the Every Pilot in Control Solution Standard that's freely available to the industry around the world to help guide operators that want to do it right and what it takes to implement a solution that doesn't just fill an X on an X board to say you accomplish something, but to truly overcome this number one threat to air safety that is unnecessarily killing people around the world. So with that, very quickly, what ICAO talks about, and you can come back and look at it, is an integrated solution. It starts with academic on air, correction, on air, academic training, which is very specific academics, on aircraft training to address the human factors, non-type specific simulator training. We see that in ATP, CTP in the United States. Type specific simulator training like we're seeing in the United States with uh, FAR 121-423 extended envelope training supported by ACs 121.11 and 121.09, and then augmenting it with improved instructor operating stations. And a lot of this requires an improvement in technology to accomplish this. The problem, the technology side is far easier than the real challenge, which is creating the expert instructor to lead us through that process. So today, we are going to start with a discussion that begins with the instructor and then every area of the implementation of a program to take what ICAO is doing and doing as intended, but also we're going to be talking about how to take it to the next level. Starting with the ICAO solution, which is now struggling, and at least getting that in place is going to help safety, but there's way more that can be done when it comes to loss of control and flight. And that's really where our superpower is of APS. We know how to do it, what it takes, and what's required from a training standpoint to accomplish it. And that's what we're going to represent by the Every Pilot in Control Solution Standard. So, with that introduction, Otter, why don't we go over to you to start introducing the concepts one by one. Yeah, this, uh, this pie you see here is what we're going to address, each of these pieces of the pie uh, there. I'll start off talking about the number one there in light blue, uh, elite instructors. Uh, we've, we've got to uh, have specialized training and qualifications for the instructors themselves. We can't just take our current CFI uh, regime out there and just tell them to start teaching it because they largely haven't been trained themselves. So we've got to have IPs, uh, instructors that have had the all attitude uh, experience necessary to uh, deliver the training, but also have some commercial experience as well. They need to understand what is appropriate to transfer, what type of skills that are transferable. Uh, there has to be a mastery of the positive skill transfer across the training platforms and the uh, fleet types. The instructor needs to be trained in how to deliver the appropriate skill sets so that there's not negative training and negative transfer of skill. And I think ICAO starts to talks about that to some extent. So let's talk about that previous graphic a little bit. What does it say about the instructor? Well, it explains that the instructor needs three levels of mitigation, awareness, prevention, and recovery. No longer is it just about maneuver-based recovery. There's a, there's a layered implementation of mitigation required by the instructor that needs to be facilitated in a number of different training platforms to include academic, on-aircraft, and advanced simulation. But interestingly, the role of the instructor is, yes, escalating from awareness, prevention, to recovery. But really the key to maximizing the effectiveness of upset prevention and recovery training is the instructor's mastery of de-escalating all the way from the recovery back in to the heart of the envelope. Very interesting, a very different approach to instructor training, but that's what's necessary to be effective at upset prevention and recovery training to actually overcome the threat of loss of control. And what's it's something, next, yeah, and it's something that takes uh, over five weeks of initial training for our new instructors. As well, just to get them to a basic on aircraft UPRT uh, skill delivery set. Sure does. All right, the next piece of the pie is the integrated program. There, uh, there has to be appropriate academics. Uh, our typical run of the mill academics that we have in flight training is not sufficient. Uh, we need on aircraft platforms. Uh, especially all attitude, and then the advanced simulation devices, including uh, virtual reality, maybe even MR and AR as well. All of this has got to be harmonized and overlaid uh, there uh, in a matter of days. You can't do it in just one day, and you shouldn't spread it out over uh, weeks, months, or even years. It's got to be a certain intensity, and we'll talk about that here in a minute. 
Yeah, and so to give an idea of that, so what does this paradigm shift to UPRT actually look like? Well, we need to really approach the threat differently. If we're just not talking about implementing the basic solution of ICAO, we need to look differently at how we operate. So if we take a spectrum of where fatal accidents are recurring as an example shown here, we can see that you, the UPRT program has to be focusing on those areas where the data demonstrates that it's occurring. So there's a couple of dimensions. We gotta be focusing on where it's occurring, where we operate the airplane in our profile, what type of airplane that we operate, all the way down to type specific considerations, but most importantly, and this is the one that usually is lagging in the industry, especially as we're seeing in EASA's implementation of on-aircraft UPRT, is addressing the human factors, training the human being to be resilient in crisis, and that takes time on how to do that. Unfortunately, the downward pressure on time for training, the downward pressure on the price of training programs is going to mid limit our ability to do this properly. But I can tell you right now, the reason why the human being in this graphic is the biggest part of it, because that's the most significant barrier we have of implementing effective UPRT. And we'll talk more about it in just a minute in intensity. Otter, over to you. Yeah, training intensity, next piece of the pie uh, there, human factors have to be contained while embedding these all latitude skills. There are certain psychophysiological issues that pilots have to learn how to overcome, and we can really only do that in proper platforms, especially the on-aircraft arena. Uh, the training intensity requires substantial on-aircraft training flights to foster this resiliency uh, that they need in order to be able to access their skills in a crisis. If the been there, done that t-shirt means a lot. So just uh, doing simulator-based training is not going to be sufficient to address the intensity. Well, let's talk about now what it actually takes to train a pilot. Now, as an organization, a company, we wish we could do it in one flight. We wish we could do it in three, two flights. We actually wish we could do it in three flights, but the reality of it is it takes more than that. The human being, for whatever reason, to get the dendrites connecting in the brain properly, to truly get into a condition of over-learning and resilience to be successful in a crisis event takes time. And unfortunately, the ICAO requirement only requires three hours, which is often broke up into three flights. You can accomplish the what and how of UPRT in that amount of time, but it's not enough time for the cognitive training of the pilot. It's just been proven. And we train pilots all the way from general aviation, but mostly in military and corporate aviation where they have thousands and thousands of hours of experience. It's not about a new pilot not being able to learn quickly. It's about being a human being and how your brain works. So let's take a look at this very quickly. And we have an entire webinar that talks about this diagram in great detail. We're going to hit it at a very high level right now. So when we start UPRT, there's essentially no change. And later, we'll talk about how we determine what that capability level is, but, well, but between about 20 and 40 percent, about a 30 percent success rate in, in testing pilots in a startling situation where they didn't know what particular maneuver was coming, but they knew they were being tested. We determined that the success without effective training or the training that the industry is providing is about a 30 percent success rate with one UPRT flight. We see that there's an increase largely due to an awareness increase and in habituation, getting used to what's going on. And most people would expect that trajectory of continuing learning would continue at an upward gradient, but it doesn't. Now, this regression occurs when you're in a program that's designed to train the cognitive processes of the brain. It necessarily requires an regression, of sen regression to sensitization. I can tell you right now, we can take a person up in two flights and make them feel like King Kong at the end of it, but we're not actually giving them the cognitive training they need to succeed. In a program that's done properly, and we've tried every which way from Sunday to do this, regression is required in the second flight for them to now get into a mode of learning. The brain is going through conditioning to now follow through in the next flight of further habituation and then extinction of fears to be able to be effective in a crisis event they're truly starting to build the been there, seen that capability that they need to be successful. And then the fourth flight, the third day, is where we see a huge acceleration in competency. Then the added of integrated training, virtual reality simulation adds depth and resilience and fills in the gaps of how they operate and where they operate their airplane to ultimately arrive at a scenario of having all factors in place, habituation, extinction, reappraisal, and over learning, it's now a skill set embedded with them. 
and we continue to grow that skill set, hopefully through complementary recurrent training sessions. Anything to add on that, Otter? No, no, it is fascinating. And it took us a lot of years to really figure this out, how best that pilots do learn. We literally see this every day with hundreds and thousands of pilots year over year over year. It is just the way the human being learns. And to deny this is to deny them the, the capability and the competency they need to be successful in a crisis. And remember, the very best recovery is never being there in the first place. This process gives them both recovery capability, but vastly improve awareness and prevention capability as well. Okay, Otter, what's up next? Next piece of the pie is you need a program that's going to employ the best practices, uh, ICAO, IANA, FAA, and uh, some of the specialized training organizations came together and they came up with some guidance that's very good and largely robust uh, there. So you need to ensure that these, these uh, guidelines are implemented in the training program. And there's many of them. What I want to talk about here today is something that in, in 2014, when the ICAO manual on upset prevention and recovery training came out, IATA came out with a document the very next year identifying best practices. And in there, they talk about something that is very important, but often gets overlooked in implementing an effective UPRT program. And that's the implementation of a strategy or a call out process when you're doing effective upset prevention and recovery training. And as we see, as we train general aviation pilots, airline pilots, corporate executive pilots, professional pilots, military pilots, you need to be cognitively trained with call-outs to be conditioned in an airplane upset event. How do you get yourself organized to do the right thing in the right order to get yourself mitigated or diagnosed back into the heart of the envelope? This is one example of a strategy that APS uses, the all-attitude upset recovery strategy, but fundamentally, a strategy has to consider the following areas, and it has to be transferable. It has to include type-specific considerations. It needs to manage angle of attack, first and foremost in the process, manage lift vector, energy management, integrate secondary controls to ultimately manage the flight path divergence. Strategy, as you will find when you go through a comprehensive or robust program, is the foundation from which all competency and capability comes and again, largely gets overlooked or gets inserted without the instructors truly knowing what it is, how it applies. But the biggest threat here is the instructors not understanding what the exceptions to the strategy are. So it's a real challenge to implement this. I know that when we started rolling this out with 15,000 pilot airlines, there's a lot of objections. But as long as you have a third party resource that could come and address those objections to rationalize it in a way that the pilots understand it makes perfect sense, and it transfers to all types of fixed-wing airplanes, including fourth-generation fly-by-wire Airbus airplanes, advanced Boeing conventional airplanes, and even fly-by-wire Boeing aircraft. Otter, I'll just, I'll just strategy? Re yeah, I'll just reemphasize that it's one thing to have a recovery strategy, but it's another to be taught it or to know how to teach it in a transferable way. Yeah, and that has to occur while the cognitive conditioning is taking place as well for it to be truly embedded. And it has to be done properly and thoroughly. Repetition of proficiency is key, but that repetition of proficiency has to be guided and counseled and really led by an instructor that's an expert in its application across all domains of implementation from on aircraft to simulation to actual in-flight operations of commercial and corporate airplanes. Okay, Otter. All right, this next one is purpose-built platforms uh, implemented uh, to install eight critical uh, QLMC mitigation criteria. We're going to talk about that here next, this critical mitigation criteria. There's a laundry list of them. Uh, we've got to optimize the use of each of the integrated platforms to fill the skill sets and knowledge set gaps. Okay. Again, we have an entire webinar on this, and a lot of this is counterintuitive. And what you want to do as a program implementation expert or somebody who's charged with implementing UPRT, and your goal is to not just do the regulatory minimum, but overcome the threat of loss of control. Here are the top eight criteria that matter the most. There's more than this, but these are the eight critical items. And you'll see on the right what the best, best platforms are. And this is assuming that the program is being implemented in accordance with EPIC S2, the Every Pilot in Control Solution Standard. You can see the relative weight of those factors. 
and they're ordered from most important to less important, not least important. But when you're auditing your program and often the top three get missed, you have to be comprehensively addressing human factors. The program has to be accomplished in an all attitude environment and it must integrate strategy as we just previously talked about. Get those knocked out, then we need to look for G awareness. There has to be sufficient repetition and proficiency. You'll also need to address very low altitude, all weather upsets. You can see the simulator's the best platform for that. And then the CRM, SRM, and then least but not unimportant is to be sure that representative control feel and responses are addressed in the program. It is not the top one by any stretch. It has to be integrated, but human factors, all attitude, environment, immersion, and strategy are vastly more important done properly than representative control field and response. That said, it, the solution must integrate and consider all of these. And it's interesting how most people think that having an aircraft that represents your control and response of your aircraft is, is most important, but that's not the case. And the simulator is really the best for the latter one, but the simulator on its own is not a full mitigation. In fact, in our judgment, it's around a 46 mitigation percent mitigation of the threat. And we have those uh, developed from our analysis related to the quantitative loss control and flight mitigation criteria. Okay, last part of the pie here, Otter. Last one is initial and recurrent training. Uh, definitely have to have this initial training that's compliant, intense, and comprehensive uh, there in order to get your full loss control and flight mitigation. Uh, there are perishable skills, however, uh, we would all probably appreciate that there's a lot of counterintuitive skill sets that have to be developed and they are perishable, hence the need for recurrent training. Great, and just to give an idea of that, here's what we're seeing, and this is for really decades of work. Back in 2007, 2008, that bracket you see between 20 and 40%, we investigated 135 pilots coming through our program in a couple months. And we brought them in. We explained to them they were going to be tested. We explained to them what they would do that was wrong, what they should do that's correct. Gave them an opportunity to go up in the airplane to handle the aircraft, get familiar with it. Then we introduced five startling events to them. And we found that their capabilities were between 20 and 40% of recovering the airplane within the performance capabilities of their aircraft. There was no special technique required. We were just looking for a safe and effective recovery. Now, what we determined was, is that in that process is that we had to first off determine that the training occurred at the training organization. And through a matter of a couple of days of doing the training properly, like we see in Epic S2, we see a vast increase in capability by the end of the third day or two and a half days in of a 96% capability on average but it never fully mitigated the gap, which we'll talk about in a second. Most importantly, though, is the ongoing recurrent. And you see these atrophies of skills that we can observe over time that occur. We continue to recommend that UPRT should be accomplished every year. Most flight departments and organizations self-select every two to three years. But most importantly, you can see that the peak goes up at recurrent and the atrophy of skills slows as you continue to build a lifelong program. Sadly, but the reality is we're never going to fully mitigate the effect of upset or of loss of control in flight because human beings are human beings and beings. Airplanes do fit are unrecoverable, unfortunately. Otter, anything to add to that before we go to our last slide? No, no, that was great. All right, folks. So that's the overview of what the paradigm shift looks like. There's your booklet to download the Epic S2 guide. If you're in our area, please take advantage of the APS evaluation. Come and see us. And as I mentioned earlier, depending on the size of your organization, we can give you, get you up uh, flying in airplanes and jets and certainly into the simulator. So with that, Otter, I'd like us to head on over to questions. So back to you, Randy. Well, BJ and Otter, I understand our sound might have not worked well as I was doing our introduction, but uh, I think everybody knows well the expertise that you guys have. So I'm going to bring you in here and uh, we just have about four minutes. So what I'd like to do is kind of summarize some of the questions that people might have. Could you kind of put this all together uh, and, and use what you just presented to address the theme of transforming low experience to high safety. How does that all fit together with today's theme? 
DJ? Yeah, it's a big question, Randy, and I'm looking at the time here with about three minutes left, so I think there's a lot to it. You know, I did actually see a question there by Alex, Alexandro, I think it was, about uh, yeah. the startle effect and so on, and we're going to talk about uh, fly-by-wire airplanes and that a little bit later. But, you know, I actually have a slide on that, and let me just bring it up if you don't mind. Unless, Otter, do you want to chat about that real quick while I grab the slide here to bring it? Okay, while you do that, I will just say uh, – I'd like to remind everybody that not only does UPRT help pilots to be able to better prevent, but also recover from upsets, but what it does is it actually enhances and elevates their flight and flying skills, their manu manual handling operational skills that affects all the rest of their uh, flight profiles from takeoff to landing. Yeah, and this is a slide here uh, that I brought up that was presented back in APATS in 2019. And it wasn't talking about the value of UPRT, the, the direct value, which of course is overcoming the threat of loss of control and flight generating recovery skill. But really it comes down to the resilience and capability insights generated by having that training program and how does it improve the pilot on a day-to-day -day basis? And really it, it has to be placed in a proper position during training. So you can see where the placement is, it has to be after instrument. But you will see across the board with an effectively done program in accordance with Epic S2, improved manual handling, manual flight operation proficiency, pilot monitoring, flight envelope and performance awareness. And especially in an academy environment, you'll see that after the cadets or the students go through a training program, a comprehensive UPRT program, you'll see the re-rides and extra dual flights drop to almost zero just because they're in key increased capability and awareness day to day. On the other side, it also we see increased airmanship and decision making threat and air management, improve resilient and crisis. It seems like it's a, it's the silver bullet, but I'll tell you what, the reason why that paradigm shift is so essential is because there's a massive deficiency in the way we're currently training pilots. And UPRT done properly, as we see from our air carrier partners, is it really permeates all areas of how a pilot operates if it's done properly. But it's just not meeting the ICAO regulatory minimum. That's a great place to start. We have a long way to go to get there but integrated in an, uh, implemented in an integrated fashion from the beginning of a pilot career with effective on-aircraft training and then right into uh, how they operate day-to-day -day is a big part of it. So Randy, I know we need to wrap up, so we got about 40 seconds left. Over to you to finish things up. We do, but I think our first two sessions uh, with the Captain Danny Hull talking about uh, the introduction of these skills for training pilot, airline pilots in the future and your robust presentation of the factors required are going to be a great introduction for real life airline training, which is going to be addressed next by Captain Brad Bennett and Atika Tsui from Fiji Airways. So let's go ahead and listen to them. Okay. See you later, guys. It's my honor and privilege to introduce Captain Brad Bennett with Global Airways based in South Africa, where he's a training captain on the A320. The title of the presentation today is Developing Effective Airline Pilot Upset Recovery Competency. I'd like to talk a little bit about Brad's background. He has 20 plus years of Boeing 737 and Airbus experience on a variety of fleet types. He was an Airbus display pilot for South African Airways and has over 17,000 hours on 65 fleet types. A particular importance to today's conversation is expertise in UPRT. Brad is arguably the world's leading practical UPRT implementation expert on A320, A330, and A340 Airbus fly-by-wire airplanes with vast experience implementing UPRT programs on the Boeing 737. He has a grade one instructor rating, 
And from an all-attitude experience standpoint, he has 18 years of competition and air show display flight experience, over 600 low-level air show performances, and his team won two silver medals at the World Grand Prix of Aerobatics in UAE and Japan. He's an air show display authorization examiner with the South African Civil Aviation Authority. And most importantly, from our perspective, he's seven years now as an APS certified Airbus type specific UPRT check airman and train the trainer instructor, APS's highest instructor rating. Let's go over to Brad. He's easygoing, well spoken, a true expert, and a great friend. Over to you, Brad. I'd like to thank APS for the invitation to speak at this year's UPRT Safety Summit and to share my experiences of training around a thousand pilots in the airline environment, specifically on the Airbus 320, 330 and 340. In considering the theme of this year's summit, I'd like to focus on my experience as a UPRT project leader over the past nine years, whereby we trained instructors, some of whom had little or in some cases no experience in the all attitude flying environment, and how we transform that low experience into high aviation safety. Uh, The theme of this summit also pertains to our airline line pilots who also had little or no experience in the all attitude flying environment and how they developed to attain the skill sets that were required in their toolbox to deal with upset recognition and prevention. Their skill sets were ultimately tested in real life during a high altitude severe overspeed event which resulted in an effective stall recovery over the Swiss Alps a few years ago. So a brief description of how South African Airways developed their UPRT training program. In 2012, we had a management team of four pilots visit APS in Phoenix to carry out the Train the Trainer course. In 2013, we redeveloped the Train the Trainer course for Airbus Specific in conjunction with APS and IDT. More instructors were then trained at APS to form our core group, And in 2013, we rolled out the program to our line crew. From 2000 to 2013 to 2020, we trained 750 pilots, 12 instructors, and went through two cycles of recurrent training. So during this period, we also experimented with the idea of putting a group of non-core instructors through a shortened or abridged training program uh, to teach limited aspects of UPRT. Unfortunately, this proved unsuccessful due to the lack of the time available to train and reinforce proper standardization, and in turn we experienced an unacceptable amount of instructor drift. This in turn reinforced our belief that the time and investment in training instructors is key to a successful UPRT program and must be protected by standardization to avoid negative training. Now, I think we can all agree on the fact that currently the largest threat to aviation remains the loss of control in flight. And this is directly related to pilot training and a degradation in manual handling skills. Effective pilot UPRT is required to mitigate loss of control in flight. And the key to effective UPRT is a properly trained instructor. There's consensus in the industry that special emphasis on instructor training is needed due to the fact, and I'm going to quote the Arkeo manual, In UPRT, the safety implications and consequences of applying uh, poor instructional technique or providing misleading information are arguably more significant than in other areas of pilot training. If I can repeat that, the safety implications and the consequences of applying poor instructional technique or providing misleading information are more significant than in other areas of pilot training. Therefore, an essential component to the effective delivery of UPRT is a properly trained and qualified instructor who possesses sound academic and operational knowledge. Now, the problem faced by the aviation industry is a shortage of pilot instructors who have sufficient experience in the all attitude or aerobatic environments and have developed the required set of skills to deliver effective on aeroplane and simulator UPRT. Compounding this problem is the fact that, as in aerobatic flying, uh, UPRT lends itself to a higher risk of negative transfer of training due to its dynamic nature, which could be detrimental to air safety. So the question is, are the instructor skill sets required for teaching effective UPRT different from teaching in the normal day-to-day aircraft operating envelope? And can an instructor with low experience in the all-attitude flying environment 
be trained to the standard required to deliver effective and correct UPRT? The answer is obviously yes, and we proved that. Any instructor who is keen to learn and perhaps even passionate about the subject of teaching UPRT can be trained to become a highly effective instructor in this field. We proved that at SAA by selecting six instructors in our core group who specifically had no all latitude flying experience or instruction experience. Through an on-aircraft uh, training course as provided by our chosen UPRT service providers, namely Aviation Performance Solutions, and a substantial amount of simulator training, we were able to transform these instructors into highly effective UPRT instructors who demonstrated a very little instructor drift over the years by sticking religiously to the instructor training notes. Now we have to ask why is it important that instructors attend an on-aircraft training course, even if they are only going to deliver effective UPRT in a simulator? Especially when transforming low experience into high uh, safety, be it from an instructor's point of view or from the line pilot's point of view, he's learning the skill sets required. Now the answer is simple. Firstly, on-aircraft UPRT provides the immersive experience. Now what we mean by this is that the core group of instructors need first-hand experience in upset startle and recovery to teach it properly. I used the analogy previously of teaching someone how to land on an aircraft carrier when you yourself, as the instructor, have only ever read about it or perhaps watched the movie Top Gun. I'm sure Otto will agree that uh, it's pretty important when we talk about the immersive ex experience. Secondly, we have to look at human factors and startle. Now, one needs to understand fully that a pilot's brain functions differently under stress and startle compared to when there is no stress or very little stress. Uh, flying a real aircraft and experiencing UPRT is certainly the best way to understand the coping mechanisms around which the training program is de designed. The core group will then later on train the other regular instructors who normally do not possess the experience and will have to rely on the expertise of the core group to compensate for this gap. Thirdly, we have to look at um, reactions or behavior that could be considered to be counterintuitive. Um, and when we generally need startle in a real life situation to experience this phenomenon, we know that several vitally important flight control inputs uh, required by pilots during upset recovery maneuvers are considered to be counterintuitive. And this is during a time when your heart rate has gone up and your IQ has gone down. So training is needed to enable crews to perform these counterintuitive reactions or actions reliably. An example of a counterintuitive action may be, for example, unloading or pushing during a stall recovery in a nose down situation. Now, there is a caveat to what I've just said uh, in that on aircraft training for the instructor could also have a negative outcome if not applied properly in the FSTDs. Uh, on airplane and FSTD training should be from the same page. In other words, the experience gained from on aircraft training should be interconnected with the FSTD training so that they complement each other. Uh, to put it simply, FSTD training is the look module and on airplane training is the feel module. It's also very important that on airplane instructors be familiar with FSTD training especially the type-specific UPRT uh, modules. And this is obviously to ensure that a negative transfer of training doesn't occur from small aeroplanes to heavy jets. Now, over the years of training hundreds of pilots in our airline environment, we had to be careful at the early stages of the program that we didn't assume that the average line crew actually possessed a comprehensive level of UPRT-related knowledge. And in fact, in some areas, uh, there was definite knowledge deficiencies. Um, Lockheed accident data has indicated that even highly experienced flight crews exhibit signs of shortcomings in understanding and reacting to their predicament in an upset situation. Uh, according to ICAO, many uh, Lockheed accident investigations have revealed that the affected flight crew had actually received misleading information from their well-meaning instructors in their organizations. And in fact, some existing training practices were found not only to be ineffective, but were also considered to be a contributory factor, which led to inappropriate responses by some of the flight crews. Now, some examples of the knowledge deficiencies that we identified 
uh, in our organization when we rolled out the UPRT program were one, a poor understanding of aerodynamic principles in modern aerodynamics involving high altitude flight or modern wing design related to stall characteristics. Uh, this required UPRT academics to cover significant content that is not normally addressed in our normal line operations. Then there was none or very little of the understanding of the maneuvering envelope. Uh, this led to longer training times to integrate the theory with the practical. There was a very basic or insufficient knowledge of Airbus flight control laws and protections. We found over the years a degradation of manual handling skills because of the airline policy at the time and possibly underconfidence of the flight crew. Many of the crew had never flown the simulator manually at high altitude. Uh, many of our crew had never actually carried out an approach to stall in various attitudes and at higher altitudes. Few of our crew had ever faced a true startle event and therefore they had very little understanding of the physiological theory of the startle event. Um, this actually led to the crew being extremely poorly equipped to deal with startle in, and fear in a real life situation. We then had to undo the incorrect techniques that were ta taught in the past regarding the stall recovery. Uh, we had to uh, we realize the importance of the law of primacy and why UPRT must be taught correct the first time around. Uh, these differences between how we have trained in the past and current comprehensive UPRT are greater than what we initially thought. We found that the control inputs of our crew were insufficient when required such as uh, an Airbus 340 in an overbanked situation where full control inputs have never really been practiced in a simulator. We found there was a complete lack of situational awareness regarding the Airbus trim wheel uh, in a possible uh, out of trim situation. Uh, we provided extra training in dealing with Airbus mode reversions to avoid undesired aircraft states. And we had to reinforce the real meaning of some of the Airbus PFD indications on the speed scale in normal and degraded laws. In conclusion to this presentation, and I can go on for many hours, but unfortunately we are constrained by time. My last point is that during my consultations with airline FSTD instructors over the years, I'm always surprised at how little is understood about a simulator's VTE or validated training envelope and the fact that existing FSTD flight models have deficiencies in adequately representing aircraft characteristics outside of the normal training envelope. In other words, in conditions which exceed the uh, airplane flight envelope data used for the FSTD qualification. Now, many current FSTDs don't have the enhanced uh, instructor feedback tools to allow for a complete and accurate ass assessment of the student's performance. And in in the case where uh, we do have an upgraded instructor station, most instructors have not received sufficient training to use the IOS functions effectively. These limitations, if not fully appreciated by the training program designers or instructional staff, can have serious long-term repercussions by which or where flight crews uh, could be left with significant misunderstandings of upset events. In summary, through a well-developed training program, that includes a mix of on aircraft and FSTD training, low experience can be transferred into high aviation safety when it comes to both the instructor and the students. My thanks to the organizers for the invitation to share some of my experience in UPRT training, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the seminar. Thank you. Thank you, Brad. That was a fantastic start to this topic. Let's now go over to our second speaker, which is Captain Atika Twisu. Manager Flight Operations Training with Fiji Airways, and he's going to continue on the same topic that Brad started us off on. Let me talk a little bit about Atika. He started his flying career in 2002 in domestic flight operations, flying the Britain Norman Islanders, and then an Embraer EMB 110. He joined Fiji's International Airline, which was then Air Pacific in 2004, where he was a second officer on the 747. Over the years, he transitioned to the rank of captain and through the aircraft of Boeing 737, 747, A330, 
and now the E350, which is his current airplane. Atika has about 9,000 hours. In 2017, he began administrative duties at Fiji Airways, where he was the deputy fleet manager for the Boeing fleet. In 2020, he became the deputy manager flight operations training and now is the manager flight operations training at Fiji Airways. Atika is a great guy. He's just a peaceful, gentle man that is always fun to listen to. So over to you, Atika. Thanks, Paul. I'm honored to have the opportunity to speak at this year's UPRT Safety Summit and share a little about our journey into UPRT. Fiji Airways began looking into introducing UPRT into our training program around 2018. It wasn't until 2020 that we really started to think about the safety aspects and enhancements that UPRT would bring. I recall years I spent as a CRM facilitator. There was a slide that we would show identifying loss of control in flight as the leading cause of fatalities in aviation. And through the years, it remained at the top spot. So it really made sense to us that to be prepared for this very real threat was to introduce UPRT into our training program. One of the key things when introducing UPRT is selecting the right instructors, which is a fundamental component for any type of training really, because they are responsible for not only creating the right type of environment that is conducive to learning, but also the correct information is being transferred to the learner. As we all know, the right instructor can change a life, but so can a wrong one. So this was essential when making our decision to integrate UPRT into our training program. So for the selection of our core group of UPRT SME instructors, I took on board Captain Bennett's advice that our instructors needed to have experience in flight and FSDD instructing have all attitude flying experience, and this is where the honor craft training was critical, have multi-crew experience, and an important one for me is just to have the motivation to deliver UPRT correctly and to the expected standard. Personally, I'm convinced that completing honor craft training is essential for UPRT instructors, or at least the core group of instructors to become fully competent and prepared for their role. In order for instructors to effectively translate the training experience into concepts and behaviors that the trainee needs to learn to prevent loss of control in flight, the instructors themselves must undergo training that is immersive and comprehensive. Otherwise, you run the risk of negative training occurring very early on in the program. As Captain Bennett joked, it would be like teaching a pilot to land on an aircraft carrier after watching Top Gun. And I'm not just convinced because of what I've read or seen, but because this is the feedback our two instructors have shared with me on their experience when returning from their training and how that translates into training pilots in the FSTD. The unifying response was the ability to have the actual physical sensation of flying the all attitude maneuvers. When transferring that knowledge and teaching the strategies to our pilots, being able to know exactly what 2.5G feels like and what 0.5G being light in the seat feels like, and as an airline pilot having to experience almost the full operational envelope in the aircraft was absolutely invaluable. This has made them more confident when conducting UPRT, having experienced it in the, an actual aircraft. And to quote one of my instructors, I would be at a disadvantage teaching UPRT having not done the on aircraft training, having not experienced the physical and physiological factors involved. And if I could sum that up, without the proper training that they were given, especially the on aircraft training, they would have lacked the depth in knowledge and experience to effectively teach UPRT strategies. Uh, as we talk about negative training, this brings to mind a time when jet upset was a training exercise that was to be covered in one of our recurrent training cycle. Uh, there were three of us, all with instructor experience, decided to go to the simulator to see what the iOS panel had to offer in terms of presets and perhaps talk about how we would incorporate this into an upcoming cyclic. At the time, I had, I had been in discussions and building my business case to include UPRT into our training program. So I already watched a few videos of uh, Otta uh, discussing UPRT theory and demonstrating the recovery approach, which at the time I could only vaguely recall was something like push, roll and power. Anyway, we were in there messing around and we decided to select a few maneuver presets and have a go in recovering from it. 
The first couple of ones were nose high, nose low, then 45 degree bank, but it was until we went beyond the 45 degree bank preset. And as we were frozen in that position and ready for the recovery, I remember mentioning that the recovery would be exactly the same. There was a bit of confusion among us as it didn't make sense. We had different views on how the recovery would go. This was when I truly understood how dangerous an upset is and how critical having an effective UPRT program is to help us prepare for such events. Providing incorrect information to address a problem is just as bad if not worse than address if not worse than not addressing it at all. In the end, in the end we appropriately decided that during upset training the pilots would only be shown a static view of the aircraft attitudes, but there would not be any recovery attempts until we had an approved UPRT program. Proper instructor training is what builds a solid foundation for a UPRT program. The training that our instructors went through to prepare them was a systematic and phased approach that included on aircraft training, non-type specific FSTD training and type specific FSTD training. And these are essential steps during UPRT instructor training to help eliminate negative training as there are contributing factors that are sometimes not understood by the average pilot, such as the physical and physiological factors, the proper use of the FSTD, etc. There's also a key component of eliminating negative training, which is important, is the audit process that is intended to address instructor drift. With loss of control in flight still being the number one cause of fatality in evasion, it only makes sense that pilots should be trained in UPRT strategies as countermeasures to uh, UAS. To be able to observe a UPRT, UPRT session conducted by our own instructors is gratifying, but also very comforting as I know that by doing this, we are enhancing safety by addressing a real and major threat. We are still in the infancy stages of rolling out UPRT at Fiji Airways, but feedback from pilots have been positive and very encouraging, and they have really enjoyed the training. And I'm sure that they have become a more confident and safer pilot as a result. I thank you all for your time. And again, I am honored to have been given the opportunity to speak to you today. Fantastic job, guys. Just a great presentation. And I know that we have Brad here with us uh, to answer some questions. And Atik is going to join us for our last session today to answer questions there. Uh, Brad, uh, I have a couple of questions for you here from the from people participating. Is there anything you'd like to um, talk about real quick before we go to questions? Thanks, BJ. Um, I have seen some of the questions that have been coming through. Uh, there's some similarities in some of the questions. Uh, so I think let's go straight into some of those questions because it might take a few minutes to answer it and I know we've got about five minutes left. Okay, great. Well, we have this one here. Now, Atika addressed it a little bit. Let's take a little bit of feedback coming in there. Uh, Atika addressed it. Do you want to go ahead and address that? I'm just going to go on mute in case that feedback's coming from me. Yeah, sure. So um, Christoph said, could you please share your thoughts on how in small aircraft training can assist in delivering UPRT for something like an, an envelope protected Airbus 320. Now, one has to remember that UPRT skills in terms of prevention and recovery are transferable skills. They apply from the time that you start learning to fly aircraft until the time you retire as an airline pilot. Um, startle in itself uh, affects every pilot. Um, there's no one that is immune to the effects of startle. And what that does is obviously has the potential to render your brain uh, or, or to decrease your IQ to an extent. And um, one has to learn the tool, how to deal with startle in a real life situation. So we, as you know, we, we trained our uh, instructors on aircraft. The reasons for that, as I explained in my presentation, is to give them the uh, immersive experience so that they can experience startle the effects of G, the physiological effects, how that affects your thinking process firsthand. If they don't have firsthand experience in it, it's very difficult to transfer that onto your students. Um, especially when your students start doing something that you don't expect them to do. If you've seen that or experienced that in an on-aircraft airplane, you, you're better capable 
uh, sorry, you're better equipped to deal with handling um, that situation or some of the questions that the students might pose to you. The second thing is human factors and startle is why it's important for or, 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 uh, human factors and startle apply to both small aircraft and uh, large aircraft like the 320 uh, and the 340. And we know from our experience at South African Airways of a high altitude upset caused by a severe uh, decrease uh, in, in tailwind, which was in turn caused by a um, mountain wave over the Swiss Alps, we know that having a tool in your toolkit, which is the uh, strategy which we learned through APS trainings, um, which is not just saying push roll power stabilize, but understanding how to apply that strategy, being trained how to apply the strategy, and having gone through your current training programs to prevent uh, this degradation of your understanding of uh, UPRT uh, skills. Uh, we know that uh, that could apply in a small aircraft, a big aircraft, a business jet, 320, 340. What's also important is that the aircraft experience of learning UPRT on a small airplane has to, uh, you know, for the instructor's point of view, um, has to be interconnected with the FSTD training and making sure that you don't apply any negative training that would affect uh, or that is non-type specific for that specific aircraft module. So I hope that answers uh, Christoph's question. Yeah, I think it does, Brad. That's great. I'm just looking at the time here, and I'm kind of going back and forth on mute, I think, to stop some of the feedback. I'm, well, let's go with a short one here right now, and I think this is something that is a really good one. It's not one I've heard before, but I think that you'll find interesting, and it's from Rodrigo. It's to train you PRT instructors. Do you tailor a program after assess, assessing one's level, or is the same program to all? Brad? Brad? Thanks, Rodrigo. Yeah, it's a very good question, that, and it's one that we had to deal with when we chose our instructors to, uh, which was quite an expensive thing to, to send over to, uh, to to the states to do the training. So, you know, it was unfair to say that we were going to just grab the instructors that had on aircraft, uh, sorry, uh, that had the all attitude experience. We had quite a few instructors in our airline who had competed at very high level aerobatics, who were military trained, but it was unfair to leave the guys out who had never been fortunate enough to have had that experience. So what we did is we took half guys, and half the guys were about six guys that were um, very familiar with the all attitude environment, and we selected six guys who had never been more than a 60 degree angular bank. Uh, it was a bit of an experiment at first. What we found is that as long as the enthusiasm is there to learn, and they're willing to put the time in after hours to learn the keywords, to learn the uh, structure of delivering the content as, uh, for the theory as well as the strategy, they were successful every single time. So they did require a bit more training. Our instructors went to APS, they did the, uh, the, the four or five day on aircraft training program, which included two simulator sessions. They then came back to South African Airways and they did um, four, four hour sessions. Uh, the guys that had never done who had never, uh, who did not have the all attitude experience, ended up doing about six simulator sessions. So it's about another eight hours of training for them. But the success rate at the end was um, the same for, for for any level of instructor, provided that the correct training is applied, or is given, and provided that they've got the enthusiasm to to see it through. Great, Brad. Thank Great, you so Brad. much. Thank I know that so we're much. over time here right now a little bit, but I sure thank you for being available there in South Africa. So I'm just going to pop you out of the event here to get going on, but just always love your expertise and your perspective on everything, Brad. So thank you, sir, very much for all you do. All right, folks, we're going to go ahead and move on to the next one. We have Captain Philip Adrian. I see him standing by getting ready to go. So uh, we're going to go ahead and wrap up this session and we'll get going as soon as we can with the next one. So thank you, everybody, for being here today.
Hello, and welcome to session four of the 2022 UPRT Safety Summit for Professional Pilots Worldwide. My name is Randall Brooks. I'm the Executive Vice President for Flight Operations at Aviation Performance Solutions, and I'm pleased to introduce Captain Philip Adrian, who currently serves as the CEO of MPS, a leading fixed base simulator manufacturer for the Airbus A320 and Boeing 737 series. Philip is a fellow of the Royal Aeronautical Society, and he will be speaking on recommendations leading to enhanced UPRT implementation in the future. Philip started as CEO at MPS in May of 2018 after 11 years at Boeing, where he fulfilled multiple roles, ending as chief pilot regulatory strategy. He joined, joined Boeing in August of 2007 as an instructor on the 737, 777, and 787. He was also involved in the design and flight testing of all new Boeing products. Philip's career started in the Royal Netherlands Air Force, where we went through officers and pilot flight training, and he was a flight instructor prior to becoming an airline pilot in 1992. During his entire career, Philip has served on several rulemaking groups in the aviation industry, including FAA Aviation Rulemaking Committees, EASA Rulemaking Tasks, and many boards regarding flight safety, aviation security, and crew resource management. Significantly to our discussion of UPRT and loss of control in flight today, Philip co-chaired both the FAA Aviation Rulemaking Committee regarding UPRT, and he chaired the ICAO LOCART initiative and the ASA rulemaking on upset prevention recovery training. He's the vice chair, uh, chair-elect of the Royal Aeronautical Society Flight Crew Training Group. In his career, Philip has operated, flight tested, and instructed for over 13,000 hours. Philip is a fun guy to work with, which is why he probably gets invited to so many rulemaking groups and uh, other uh, joint efforts. And we're really happy to have Philip able to join us today. Thank you very much. Take it away, Philip. Thank you for that kind introduction, Randy. And it's a pleasure to speak to you all on this APS summit on UPRT. The name of my presentation is the halftime show of UPRT, and I'm asking the question whether we are winning the game. But first of all, let me add a little bit to the introduction that Randy had. We have done a lot on UPRT. We have started in earnest in about 2009 after the Colgan Air 3407 event in the US and the Air France 447 event over the Mid-Atlantic on the way from Brazil to France. At that point in time, we had the IKT working group under the leadership of Dr. Sunjo Advani and led by the Royal Aeronautical Society, which basically started in June of 2009. In the US, US Public Law 111.216 was introduced on August the 1st of 2010 and it was preceded by House Regulation 5900. We also worked with all the OEMs at that point in time to standardize the recovery templates for stall events. That would cover both approach to stall, as it was then called, and stall. The FAA ARC Aviation Rulemaking Committee 208, that was titled Stick Pusher and Adverse Weather, published its report on November the 30th, 2011. And that was the introduction to what became LOCART, an ICAO-led event where I had the honor of chairing that together with my good friend, Lou Neyman. The ICAO DOC 10011, which came after LOCART and was the result of the recommendations from both ICT and the LOCART proceedings, were published in 2014. Mm -hmm. The EASA rulemaking task to actually put it into local legislation started in May 2015, and it, it would address both recurrent training and initial training. At that same time, we also worked on the update of the Airplane Upset Prevention and Recovery Training Aid, Revision 3, which was finally issued in 2017. However, we started before that already with, for example, the initial versions of the airplane upset recovery training aid, 
We did stall training in many different ways, or we didn't. We used to uh, identify minimum loss of altitude in the recovery. We used to do it in a very controlled environment. We have learned a lot since then. But as my presentation identifies, it is only half time. The World Cup soccer is starting in about a week from now. And with that, I've tried to put it into that perspective. It takes normally a generation, 20 to 25 years, to change our habits. And with that, we're halfway, but we are on our way and well on our way. So we had a flurry of activities, as I identified before. But what is the result? Well, first of all, the low card recommendations. As many of you know, ICAO is not a regulatory body, but it identifies what should be incorporated into local regulations. And many countries have accepted and introduced the low card recommendations. These include and are not limited to on airplane training requirements during the licensing part. Changes in simulator fidelity and in the IOS requirements, the instructor operating station supporting the instructor in this effort. It also identified training requirements, differences in requirements for the instructors and for the students and for the regulators and the oversight. However, despite all these activities, we have not made a dent into the statistic. The percentage of loss of control in flight events is still similar or the same as it was beforehand. So in a way, so far the first half, we're at best at a tie. We're not losing, but we're not winning either. We need to make sure that during the second half of this effort, we are focusing on getting better and eradicating all that statistics of the loss of control in flight. So we are getting better, but we are not there yet. So what happened in other countries that did not one-on-one -on -one adopt the low-card recommendation? Well, first of all, the low-card recommendations, as with any regulatory framework, they have been seen as interpretable in different ways. They have been accepted partly or fully in different countries, but some countries, for example, do not require on airplane training. They consider that as a responsibility for the commercial air transport organizations or see it as a voluntary thing. The simulator requirements that we introduced to avoid the negative transfer of learning cannot always be met or are extremely expensive. Um, we have to deal with some OEMs, some uh, airplane builders that are no longer in business where the data might not be available or as dense as we would like it to support these kind of simulated training. Also the training requirements, as with many regulations, could be incorporated as generic and could lead to a tick to box exercise rather than an actual uh, achievement of competency. And the instructor requirements have led mostly to well-qualified instructors. But also, we still see some outliers where weird things is, uh, are told by weird uh, ways of interpreting different kinds of data. We need to standardize. We need to standardize globally. So first of all, we need to make sure that everybody can do this. The low-hanging fruit, and I've spoken on this before, is knowledge and the application of knowledge. And whether your regulatory body sees this as a competency or not, it is the basis of everything. It is also something that is achievable for everything. We know that simulated data updates are expensive. We know that on-airplane training could be expensive. However, we also know it's very important to avoid the possibility of negative transfer of learning. But the low-hanging fruit for everybody to be achieved is knowledge. Focused on the solid foundation of knowledge. It is almost free, can be 
gained from the start of your career. Reading, learning, and understanding is important, but make sure you gain relevant knowledge because we talk about experience, but experience is something that you need to have on specific levels. The other part is prevention. Prevention can be as simple as making a decision to not do something or to avoid going into a situation where you're not 100% sure of the outcome. Make a risk assessment prior to a maneuver. Decision-making is essential and it's very unexpensive. So we can start with proper decision-making right from the beginning of the career. The application of knowledge, once proper knowledge has been established, is the most certain way to keep you out of trouble most of the time. So the knowledge and the application of knowledge builds experience. For example, you can talk about G-forces on paper, but until you feel them in an actual airplane, they're kind of meaningless. Maybe people have been in a roller coaster, but to actually control the G-forces is something that we need to understand and need to feel on our body, which is one of the reasons why we recommend it on airplane training prior to being allowed into a type rating. This is an essential part of your foundational knowledge. Now, during the type rating, the type-specific knowledge becomes important, not only during the type rating itself, but as long as you operate that airplane. As long as you operate that airplane, you should be aware of what is generically called the type-specific characteristics of your specific airplane. So what does that mean? Well, maybe, simply speaking, you become an airplane whisperer. What is your airplane telling you? What do you do with that information? That is what it's all about. It is making sure that you correctly interpret what you see and control or correct it. So it's not about knowledge. It's about applied knowledge. This is not necessarily about how an airplane stalls or gets into an upset, but it's how it got there, what did you do or what did you not do to prevent in the first place and stopped it from getting worse? What were the decisions leading up to your upset event? Did you decide to go above your optimum altitude to the maximum altitude, but didn't consider the weather forecast? Do you even understand what a coughing corner is or have you even heard about it? What do the colors and symbols on the speed tape tell me? How does my airplane communicate to me? Why don't you want to see those messages in the first place? Remember, most of our experience as pilots is fantastic sitting in the front of an airplane, whether you sit on the left seat or the right seat, and looking at everything going right. It is great. But all these messages that are at the corners of the envelope where we normally do not operate, we want to make sure that we are aware of them. We want to make sure that we understand what they mean. And we also want to make sure that when my airplanes, oral, tactile, or visual warnings talk to me, what, is they, what does that look like? What does that feel like? What does that sound like? And more importantly, what do I do with that? All of these things are foundational for a safe flight operation and should be taught early and often. It's not only during the type rating. It's not only during the initial phases of training. It is throughout the career. As I've always stated, this is not something that you start or you stop. This is something that you continue to do until your last and final commercial flight. This is for you, for your passengers, and for everybody to guarantee safety. So during the regulatory proceedings of the uh, aviation rulemaking committees, the rulemaking tasks, the uh, ICAO low card, we focused on the what and the how. What do we need to train? How do we need to train it? We need to train upset prevention and recovery. We need to uh, teach stall prevention and recovery. 
So how do we do that? We have talked about the on-airplane training to address some of these things. We've talked about the simulators. But one of the main things that I've learned during these findings is that it's not always the what and the how that are important, but it is the who. One of the events that we did during Locard was identify a stall model that would be better than the stall model that we used to work with. And an interesting fact occurred. The pilots that were part of the working group, they were all at the top of their game, top of their company, and, and all were either test pilots or senior instructors. But many of them, when they're trying to identify whether they're working with a generic stall package or a Boeing created stall package, they forgot to even identify whether they were stalled or not. So rather than focusing on the how or the what, we should focus on the who. The pilots, as always, are the last line of defense. We need to ensure that we're providing them proper guidance on what they're up against in their career. Upset prevention and recovery training is very important, but cannot be seen in isolation. And that's when we're looking at the second half of this effort is something that I'm looking forward to seeing incorporated. So what are we still missing? Well, first of all, we should be looking at this from a competency-based approach with regard to training and assessment. So rather than looking at three hours in an airplane, five hours in a simulator, or whatever your local regulation state, rather than it becoming a kind of standard way of training in your simulator once a year, let's always look at this as a competency or a set of competencies. Because this is not a single thing. This is not just flying the airplane. This is a combination of situational awareness, decision-making, all these kind of efforts to avoid loss of control in flight need to be incorporated to keep the training fresh. And once again, I would be remiss to say, to not say that this is not about experience on the airplane. You can measure experience in a logbook, but a competency is something that should be achieved and should be measurable. So what does and doesn't experience mean? We want to avoid to tick the box and say, because we've done it, we're experienced. Experience cannot only be measured in how much you've done something, but it should be identified in how well you do and deal with everything. For me, just flying around and logging hours is, is a great way to make a living. But the pilots of Air France 447 and many other unfortunate situations like this, they were maybe experienced in the traditional sense of the word, but they were not prepared for the mayhem that they experienced in the events in question. So what does the second half look like? First of all, let's continue to focus on vigilance and awareness rather than rely on the training from last year and put that in our back pocket. We, as the pilots, are in the flight deck to prevent upsets and to prevent stalls. So remember that old saying, I use my superior judgment to avoid having to use my superior skills. So with that, and many of the other teaching points that you'll hear today. I want you to enjoy the second half of the UPRT game. And remember that we're only winning this once we prevent all these events from happening and to eradicate this entire column in the accident statistic. We can do that through proper training, proper foundational knowledge, use of the appropriate task to tool analysis. That means the right airplanes, the right simulators, the right training. Do it in a competency-based approach. And with that, we are certain to win this game in the end. So with that, I've come to the end of my presentation and I look forward to any questions you may have during the upcoming question and answer session. 
Thank you for listening to me on this very important topic. And I want to give it back to Randy for his closing notice. Well, thank you very much, Philip, for uh, living up to my introduction. Uh, you certainly do have a grasp on this uh, based on your work in the past uh, that we all benefit from. Um, we've got a couple of questions that have come in that I think you're also the perfect person to answer, having uh, done some of this stuff on aircraft uh, while you were with Boeing and now that we're, we're with a flight simulator uh, training device manufacturer from Ricardo Crespo. We have the question, could you please explain how could you simulate the startle effect during some flight training section? So uh, how do you think we can uh, introduce startle effect in, uh, in, in virtual, in a simulator training device? This has been discussed uh, extensively in both ICADI, uh, the ARC uh, with the FAA, LOCART and EASA. Um, one is to make sure that uh, the situation doesn't become stale. Uh, we, we too often train an engine failure at V1. If you train an engine failure at V1 often enough, everybody knows what is coming and they, they do the right thing. So we need to have variety in air training. It needs to be sometimes environmentally introduced. Other times it can be through an airplane malfunction, uh, those kind of things. But we need to have the variability in our training. And then the other thing uh, that we see and that we have seen in the low card uh, findings as well is distraction leads to uh, startle more than anything else. Uh, so a, a, a distraction event that is even completely non-related to the upset could lead to a startle in a simulator. But in, in the end, it is about making the, uh, the training session and the scenarios dynamic and making sure that you're not doing a canned event where after three, four, seven times, you just know that it's coming, sit back, relax, and, and, and do the same thing that you've always done. That is not building experience. So introducing Stardo will be very important. Uh, it is difficult in a, a, a simulator environment, but it can be achieved, especially through distraction. Yeah, I think it's really a matter of degree. When we are doing on aircraft training, we have the benefits of the physiology in a different psychological uh, environment than we have in simulation. But I think you recall uh, the test that was run by uh, Dr. Jeff Schroeder uh, back in the iCaddy days. Um, it was a test to look at pilots' response to stall. And in that study, they had to lie to the pilots. They had to tell them that they were doing one thing so that they wouldn't be cued in on the fact that they were gonna be evaluated on their stall recovery. And it's one of the things that, that I see in our training I, that there is a difference between learning maneuvers, and you mentioned a V1 cut, and learning recoveries where there's sort of an infinite number of varieties. And, and it is a challenge, so we can understand why we're having some questions there. We have another question from uh, Javier uh, Andres Sikulkoke, and he says, and how about the CRM in the cockpit after the startle effect? Who is able to fly the aircraft, and is that the one that is performing okay or no? So can you address how we can cultivate a CRM, proper CRM in the uh, face of an upset event? I think it, uh, a, a good thing to tie back to is what, uh, what BJ and Otter were talking about earlier. It's a strategy. How do you as a crew address this. Um, it, it's too simple to say, well, the pilot flying got you into this problem, the pilot monitoring will take you out. It could have uh, been caused by malfunctions. Uh, we know the Korean Airlines uh, Boeing 747, where a, a malfunction of the uh, attitude indicator uh, was, was the contributing cause at least. Um, the CRM needs to be in place so that both pilots are at the same level of awareness and when one uh, is, is, is in, in a way going to a distracted state, uh, going away from what is, uh, is identified as the normal operation, that he or she gets called out on this. That's the first part. So it's, it's not only after the startle effect, it is right before that happens because none of these happen 
uh, or very few of these happen uh, without any warning. It is a, 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 a cascading situation. So, so that is the first part. So having that strategy in place to ensure that you are identifying where you're going and, and that's not the desired direction is one thing. Then the other uh, thing is the standard callouts that uh, most of the manufacturers have, uh, speed callouts that are identified uh, plus 10 minus 5, altitude callouts, bank callouts, those kind of things help you in your situational awareness. But in the end, it is uh, a crew effort and it's impossible to say, well, the pilot flying can transfer to the pilot monitoring and all will be well. In the end, it is both the crew members that need to support the recovery. Yeah, I, I, I know that you know, but some of our listeners may not be aware that there are standardized templates that are a variety of OEMs have come up with first for stall recovery, but that was expanded into uh, nose high and nose low recoveries. And those upset recovery templates are shared in FAA advisory circulars, in EASA uh, publications, as well as ICAO's uh, manual 111 on on uh, aeroplane upset prevention and recovery training. And those f can form the basis for any operator having sort of a standardized prescribed pathway to follow, which is one of those things that can help people through the surprise and startle that has been brought up and uh, is apparently well appreciated by our audience. So uh, thank you as always, my friend, uh, for participating. We're going to uh, leave here uh, soon to run on to our, our next session, uh, which is going to be from Paul Rattay, uh in the insurance business. So we're kind of switching things up a little bit. But thank you, as always, for your perspective. And for those of you online, stand by. We'll be getting to our next presentation uh, just after a brief break here. Thank you, Philip. Thank you, Randy. It is my honor to introduce Paul Rattay with the United States Aircraft Insurance Group, or well known as USAIG. At USAIG, Paul holds the position of Director of Aviation Safety Programs, and the topic of his presentation today is the not-so-curious linkage between upward mobility, mentorship, and safety. Let me talk about Paul and his background. He's one of the many giants we have speaking at today's event. He has a Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering from the U.S. Coast Guard Academy and an MBA from Spring Hill College. Prior to joining USCIG, Paul had a long distinguished career in the U.S. Coast Guard as an aviator. His flying experience spans the Atlantic, Alaska, and Gulf of Mexico and Great Lakes regions, and he spent nine years as a flight examiner. As the operations director of the then largest Coast Guard air station in Clearwater, Florida, he oversaw fixed wing and rotary wing operations across southeastern United States and the Caribbean Basin. At the rank of Captain 06, 
He was the commander of the U.S. Coast Guard's air stations in both Traverse City, Michigan and Atlantic City, New Jersey. Paul has over 5,000 hours of helicopter flight time and has been twice awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross for life-saving rescues in severe Alaskan conditions. He is a Commodore's List graduate of U.S. Naval Flight Training, and he holds FAA rotorcraft and single-engine airplane commercial pilot license with instrument ratings. As USAIG's Director of Aviation Safety Program, Paul facilitates relationships between providers of safety services and policyholders. He coordinates the production of USAIG's Premium on Safety quarterly newsletter and synthesizes policyholder concepts into key messaging to reinforce workplace safety. He participates as a valued participant in aviation safety forums across the USA and is a trusted safety expert and resource to both policyholders and USAIG personnel alike. I personally know Paul for many years, largely working together on the MBAA Safety Committee. I can tell you he has a great sense of humor, and he's most definitely a trusted advisor to a wide diversity of aviation and safety organizations and initiatives around the world. Paul's a great leader, a champion of aviation safety, and I consider him a personal friend. Paul, with all of that, over to you, sir. Hey, thanks for inviting me to be part of the summit this year. I'm really honored to be presenting. Let's get on with it and jump right in. So have you ever gone back and reread a book you've read previously and you had a noticeably a different experience the second time around? You know, new subplots are showing up, details emerge that you totally missed the first time around. I recently did that with an accident report and I know what you're probably thinking. This guy reads accident reports. He's a safety geek, right? Well, maybe guilty as charged, but you know, if you've never read through an accident report yourself, you should because it'll give you a whole new perspective on the way accident chains form and develop. I'm also pretty sure it'll steal your determination to never ever be the subject of one of these investigations. Every story is audience sensitive to a degree, right? What we notice most is derived from where we've been. And for many of us, where we've been has been in a highly technical and procedurally based aviation career path where the offices are the size of elevators except they have two chairs and a whole lot more buttons. That background can bias us into the technical and procedural lanes and force us to miss things on the periphery. Are procedural and technical issues ever the whole story in an accident? It stands to reason that there are nuances everywhere in an accident chain. So the accident I was looking at was this one. On a May afternoon in 2017, a Lear 35 leaves Philadelphia International Airport on a repositioning flight. The weather was good that day, except for some strong and gusty winds. 18 gusts 32 at the airport they were headed to, low level wind shear alerts being reported by landing traffic in the area. 28 minutes after they take off from Philadelphia, the pilots lose control of their aircraft while on approach to Teterboro, New Jersey. You've probably heard about this flight for at least one of two reasons. First, accidents this severe are rare in jet aviation these days, and that's a good thing. But when something this severe happens, the industry takes notice and word gets around fast, and it certainly did in this case. The other reason is that the errors of judgment and piloting practice and unprofessional behavior seemed so egregious, so blatant in this crew that it was inevitably going to become a widely discussed case study in aviation safety circles. And it's certainly been there for that. You've, you've potentially seen a postmortem on this mishap maybe more than once. And if you have, you'll recall that the JETS-2 pilots, the only occupants aboard, it was a repositioning flight, were killed when their aircraft stalled at very low altitude on approach and crashed into a parking lot about a half mile from the runway. You might think, since this is an upset prevention and recovery training summit, that my central point's going to resolve, revolve around the upset or the precursors that the pilots missed and didn't resolve. Well, that's where my analytical bias took me at first, too, on this mishap. But today, let's do something different. Let's focus on some organizational cultural issues instead. So a bit about my background. I served in the United States Coast Guard for 26 years. And a blessing and curse of serving in the military, as many of you probably know, is that they give you two or three years to acclimate into one culture, and then they rip you out of it and summarily drop you into another culture every few years and force you to reacclimate. It's awesome and frustrating all at the same time. But, you know, one thing it did for me anyway, and it probably does for many, is it makes you a bit of a student of organizational culture. You see the good, the bad, and the ugly, and you take some things away from that as you go. Well, one of my units that I served at really had it right on culture, in my opinion. It just clicked better than all the rest. And hindsight has convinced me that a primary reason is that they found a sixth year rooted in a specific aspect of mentorship. I'm gonna let you know which one it was and more about that in a bit. So 15 years before that incident's happening at Teterboro, I'm saluting the Admiral, shaking my predecessor's hand 
and I'm reaching a, a long-term personal goal of attaining command of a U.S. Coast Guard air station. I'd moved there fresh from being the operations director at then the Coast Guard's largest air station in Florida. And before that, I was deputy operations at a large air station in Alaska. So I'd been directing traffic at a couple of very busy aviation intersections for, for years on end. I felt brimming with confidence. I'd learned some things. I'd seen some things. And I was poised to come teach my new unit a thing or two about how to operate efficiently and effectively. So imagine my surprise four or five weeks in when I'm pulling my hair out, flustered and frustrated and thinking, if only these damn people issues would let up. If they just get off my desk, I'd have time to work on the things I really feel like I came here to accomplish. Well, news flashed to me at the time. The organization I'd been put in charge of already had an extremely competent and fantastic staff. And what they didn't need was somebody up in the commander's office trying to do their jobs or micromanage them. What it could benefit from was somebody taking a wide view of this culture at the place, kind of gauging what was working and what wasn't, and trying to do his or her best to steer it into better and, and stronger uh, modes. So that became my mission. And thinking deeper about the frustrations I felt early on, it kind of illuminated for me that I'd been underappreciating something that I now see as a fundamental truth. If you want a thriving and a positive culture in any organization, people, actual human issues, need to be a constant rather than an occasional focus. And that can be a hard thing for those of us that grew up in that technical, analytical, procedural aviation career path. Pivoting to the more subjective people focus, well, that might require taking a big hike outside your comfort zone. But someone, and usually someone's plural, has to do it if a positive culture is going to take hold and thrive, even on a small team. You know, too many managers today at all levels fall prey to thinking the people issues are somebody else's job. It's HR's job. As long as we provide direction and resources in a safe working environment, we've met our mandate. Well, maybe you have legally or not. I'm not sure about that, but I can tell you, you haven't met it if you want a thriving, uh, thriving culture. So years prior, there had been a political campaign, I think, that used it's the economy, stupid, as a slogan to stay on, st on, on task and prevent them from drifting off message. Well, I wrote a note that said, it's the people, and I slid it under the glass on my desk where I keep seeing it, and it actually helped me, and it leads me to my key point number one of four today for today's talk. For a positive culture to develop and thrive, people need to be a constant rather than an occasional focus. You know, in every organization I've seen with a positive culture, I can identify people at various levels that get this. And in almost every case where the culture is struggling, you'll find gaps where either nobody has this view or more commonly, People issues are treated as a part-time secondary concern that we'll get to after we get through the important stuff. That observation seems kind of profound to me when you think about it. As it turns out, people really like having opportunities to advance. More knowledge, better pay, greater responsibility, higher, resp higher qualifications. You know, this works for millennials and Gen Zers too. Everybody feels this way. And I'll just group those things together and call it upward mobility. Everybody likes that. And it shouldn't really come as a surprise because we can all relate, right? When we can see the next rung on the ladder and we can picture ourselves getting there and leveling up, we're motivated. Of course, when we don't have that, stagnation sets in and it leads to what I abbreviate as CAD, complacency, apathy, and detachment. You know, complacency, being dangerously oversatisfied and resistant to do anything or expend any effort to change it. Apathy, ceasing to care. I don't care how good this landing is. I don't even care if it's safe. I don't care what that customer thinks when we part ways. I don't care what my supervisor thinks of my performance, apathy. And finally, detachment, severing communications. I'm going to stop giving my opinion to the organization, and I'm going to stop listening to what the organization is saying and telling me. You know, you'll find these three enablers lurking around accident scenes, and it's not a coincidence that they're there if you think about it. Ideally, you'd like to have immunity from outbreaks of these things on your team. But as any good epidemiologist will tell you, if you haven't generated immunity, you better at least have some good defenses. So how do you go about getting good defenses? Well, one of the surest ways is to start asking, what are people here striving for? What professional development opportunities does each one of them have? Are they fair? Are they well communicated? What additional opportunities or motivating influences can the organization possibly provide? It takes considerable effort and thought and get this, actually asking the people what they'd value to feel the professional development process that can offer something for everyone. But something for everyone is your goal. And since that's the case, it needs to proliferate because one leader at the top of a large organization can't possibly reach everyone. There's a span of control issue, right? Probably three to five people. 
this, this whole notion of a professional development regime setting up as a norm in your organization has to proliferate down and become a man manageable practice at all levels to fit that span of control. The good news is that the external environment will help you. You're not going it alone here. You know, seconds in command will typically seek naturally to want to do the things to upgrade the pilots in command. Some others will seek increased responsibilities and certifications like certified aviation manager or on the maintenance side, um, inspection authorizations and many other uh, professional pursuits. But the external environment won't naturally provide enough for the right kind of pursuits necessarily that fit in your organization. You need to put in some effort as a leader to find the relevant good fits between your organization's needs and the personal needs of everyone in your immediate circle. It's hard, but I contend that that effort's worth it because if any members of your team start sensing, hey, I'm stuck and my chances of upward mobility are, are, are gone here, some bad things are going to start happening in your culture. None of them are good at all. One is that CAD sits in, and apathy in particular goes quickly, and it goes well beyond quiet quitting. People who are fundamentally achievers, those people that you actually want us to keep, well, they'll actually quit. They'll seek a different employer. An outfit that maintains a professional development focus is going to attract and retain the best employees. One that doesn't, you get it. With today's aviation workforce outlook, where do you want to be? Where can you afford to be? What might be the safety costs of not attracting the caliber of employees that you want and need to do the things you want to do? In the case of our Lear crew on their way to Teterboro, both of those pilots had a history of difficulty passing their check flights and requiring holdovers for supplemental sim work. Now, there are provisions for that, and that occasionally happens, and, and it's corrective. Uh, the corrective policies in place with the, with the training uh, regimes are helpful. But when you pair that background with these pilots with what you know about their performance on this flight, you begin to kind of develop a valid question in your mind on whether this operator was able to, even before the accident, attract the talent it needed to do the kinds of things it was doing. And if it wasn't able to attract talent from external, was it taking sensible steps internally to support growing the people that it had? To that end, there was this pro progressive qualification policy for seconds in command at the company. The second in commands would advance through five levels as they gain more and more experience. Sounds reasonable so far in light of what we've been discussing. The SIC on this aircraft who had been hired a little over eight months prior was still designated level zero, which by company policy means he was only permitted to be the pilot monitoring, never to, permitted to be the pilot flying, except when he was paired with a company check airman. Well, things begin to unravel because the operator was short staffed, had been for a long time. And due to these staffing challenges, the operator only had line captains in the layer 35, hadn't had a check airman in tight for the SIC's entire eight month term of employment. That's a pretty bleak outlook for that SIC, don't you think? Never able to, to legally touch the controls in flight. No, no hope of upgrading through the five levels that are in the company's policy manual. And it's a significant safety issue too, right? Aren't, aren't seconds in command supposed to be able to take over uh, and be proficient enough to do that if it's required of them? It's probably not surprising then, and I missed this the first time through the mishap report, that the SIC had secured alternative employment and in fact was scheduled by his new, new employer to report for SIM training in a different aircraft just a week after this accident. But here's another thing. He hadn't told management that he was leaving a week prior. That's evidence of, a, of detachment, isn't it? And as we remember, that's an accident enabler. Let's also not let the rhino in the cockpit off the hook either here. We have to talk about this because guess what? The second in command was flying this leg. At the, he was at the controls basically until just seconds before impact. The captain let the SIC fly in violation of company policy. You know, and when investigators talked to the other SIC zero in the company at the time, he said other PICs let him do it too. You know, it was one of those normalized deviations where the captains were faced with an unsavory choice. They either had to robotically defend a policy that's clearly unworkable or be a get along, go along guy who bent the rules. They were left to sort it out for themselves. The company was taking no action on what was a, a, clearly an obvious gap in organizational policy and left the captains to deal with the amb ambiguity on their own. You know, in that case, I think cultural decline is evident. There's complacency and detachment evident in the captains. Apathy can't be far behind. Remember, these things are accident enablers, right? Cultural decline doesn't have to be this evident to be present. Ask yourself, have you looked purposely at the team of people in your span of influence for any signs of them lacks upward mobility? I suspect there are pockets of this in just about every organization. You know, and my key point number two is finding and resolving cases where people on your team lack upward mobility. It's vital to avoiding cultural decline in your organization. But as we settle on that, let's avoid a few common traps that some outfits fall into. 
particularly for pilots. One is not thinking enough or at all about what happens with their captains. It takes many steps and lots of personal effort to earn a captain designation. Let's remember that. And then you get there. And then there's this initial honeymoon phase. And then the captains can then find themselves wandering around in this professional development desert. It's a mistake to put all the organization's effort into supporting pilots until they reach captain and then miss the need to keep professional growth opportunities in place for the captains thereafter. Take a captain, add one part professional stagnation, add one part policy ambiguity that the company isn't dealing with, add the protein of your choice, and you've got yourself an unhealthy procedural non-compliance salad. That's my contention, and I think that happened uh, just short of Teterboro that day. And there are lots of professional development opportunities if you look into them. Leadership courses, certifications, safety manager training. And, you know, the obvious one here, upset prevention and recovery training, presents a fantastic example. You know, a bit after attaining captaincy, that can be an ideal time in a career path to re- for a refresher on aerodynamics and a refinement in manual flying skills in addition to the, to the basics that upset prevention and recovery training provides. Those boxes all get checked big time with UPRT. It's also a great way to demonstrate that the organization is invested and focused specifically on developing and advancing its captains. And a bonus for you, it strengthens your defenses against an upset occurring on every future flight that that, that captain commands. Another flawed view organizations can fall into is that captains don't need professional development because they get plenty of satisfaction sharing their wisdom with others and bringing them up. Well, let's all admit that being able to do something good yourself does not automatically make you suited to teach it to others. Not everybody wants to do that. Not everybody needs to be an instructor. Hear that. Not everybody, not every pilot is bound to be an instructor. When you have pilots that are so inclined and and possess the characteristics of a good instructor, assign them, help them along the way in professional development along that path. But understand that that path isn't for everybody, and that's my key point here. Professional development can and should take different vectors for different people in your organization. Not everybody's going to be an instructor. Back in the Lear, we had a captain about 6,900 hours total who hadn't had any documented leadership or instructional training that the investigation turned up. And while not doing it very constructively at times, the captain devoted much of the 28-minute flight to coaching and instructing his SIC through basic flying skills. We know this because the NTSB kind of marked it out as uh, something they learned from the voice recorder. In fact, the NTSB cites the captain's own distraction due to his coaching efforts as contributing to the loss of situational awareness that enabled the accident. So reading the report the first time, I saw the captain as this incredibly poor example setter, no weather check, unprofessional cockpit, foul language in the cockpit, press on itis, uh, just continuing to press deeper and deeper into this situation as more and more confusion about where they were and what they were doing seemed to mount up. Those are horrible examples. And, and you know, as you, as you put those things together, it paints the captain as someone who's apathetic and seemingly uncommitted to a positive culture. But on the other side, he apparently felt a personal duty to take on some personal risk, bend the company rules, and give this SIC a chance to fly. And not only that, he spent the time investing in him and trying to improve the SIC as a pilot, which leads me to key point number three. If you ignore professional development as an organizational priority, you cede control. Potentially unsafe or unsound workarounds are going to sprout up on their own in your organization. They may not reinforce things that you feel are important or that are right for the organization. Remember, this summit is about staying in control. It's necessary to do that in the aircraft. It's also necessary to do that at the organizational level, too. A positive culture, like we said, doesn't need everyone to be instructors, but a related concept that applies much more broadly is mentorship, which in my view acts as a prerequisite to instructorship. Now, a mentorship program can be a formal thing where less experienced persons are specifically paired with more experienced employees. That works good if you have all those things in your organization. If you don't, NBA has a great process whereby experienced people in your organization can become mentors to people outside or less experienced people in your organization can get mentors from the outside. I'll leave it to you to check into that if that's of interest. But let's focus on just one simple thing. There's a tremendous amount of informal mentorship present in the very simple examples we set and we tolerate every single day. You know, not to freak you out or anything, but people actually watch what you do. Mentorship in its most basic form is being a good example for someone else. There's some evidence, apparently, that I'm not the first one to realize this. Think about the Lear captain. He was attempting to instruct without mentoring. Does that ever work? If you aren't showing the way, you won't be credible teaching the way. And that gets me to that unit that I was most proud of and I thought really had it going on right. It was this one up in Cape Cod, Massachusetts that I served at for three years. You know. 
The thing that set this apart was that there was a clear recognition and atmosphere of respect in everyone there for the raw power of the personal example. It was as if everyone felt a sense of kind of legacy, adding gravity to their decisions and their actions. It wasn't complex. It wasn't stuffy. We didn't even talk about it. It just became the natural order. You took your cues from people who kept working to set good examples for you. And you, you in turn, were kind of compelled to pay it forward and keep setting good examples as you went further. As things would develop here, there wouldn't be procedural noncompliance because there was an open dialogue. People were not detached. They were communicating and, and setting all kinds of good examples, basically in every quadrant. Morale was through the roof at this place. And the other thing that I remember about it is that those serving there at the time went on to career success at considerably higher rates than our peers who are serving elsewhere. That's saying something about the power of, of a personal example, you know? And as I think about how it applies to the Lear case, you know, if we were at that unit going into some of the most complex airspace and one of the most hectic ATC environments anywhere, as this crew was, we'd have studied the route. We'd have identified the gotchas. We'd have been pre-briefed and ready. Why? Because legacy is watching. And that kind of brings me to my fourth point, which is legacy is always watching. OK, consistently striving to be the best example of what you're trained and expected to do is some of the most powerful mentoring that you can that you can uh, access. And it's available to everyone and it's contagious. You know, it's not hard to imagine things you could have done differently on that May afternoon to prevent that Lear 35. If you had been sitting in the cockpit, if you had been in the flight briefing room getting ready for the flight, you could have checked the weather. You could have made some adjustments to approach speeds, all kinds of things. But my challenge to you is not that because that's the easy part for those of us that have been in this aviation career path. My challenge to you is to go beyond that and think about the things you could have done had you been in this organization weeks, months, or years before that day to interrupt this accident chain back when it started being built. I submit there are things that you likely can apply, and some or all of them may even apply in your own organization now as defenses against cultural decline. You know, I hope your organization can use the ideas I've raised today to strengthen its safety culture and boost your immunity to the threats that CAD represents. You're attending a summit focused on advancing safety through UPRT. That's one of the best professional development opportunities available to pilots today. So you're on the right track. And remember within your organization, stay consistently focused on people issues. Ask questions and resolve cases where people are stagnating professionally. Put in the effort and find opportunities for everyone that sync with your organization's needs specifically. And finally, put the free power of the person example to use in your organizational culture. It'll do great things for you and the cost is right. It's free. Thanks for listening today. Stay well, fly smart, and get home safe each and every time. Have a good day. Hello, everybody, and Paul Rate is with us now. Thank you for that presentation. Uh, Paul's in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, uh, meeting with some uh, business aviation leaders, but he's taken some time to answer a couple of quick questions for us, Paul, and thank you for that. The first question that we have for you is, what do you think an operator conveys to their pilots when they include enhanced training that's not mandatory, uh, other than part 121 carriers, such as upset prevention or recovery training? Uh, I think they convey that they're thinking strategically, right? They're, uh, they're trying to move their own workforce forward and, uh, and show the folks that, uh, that they're seeking to be a world-class organization that is very focused on safety, very focused on bringing everybody home safe every single time. You know, I think you can, it's pretty clear, you can train a pilot to fly an aircraft um, without a simulator. But along came simulators, and that technology became the way we train pilots now. Well, I think this is a similar progression. Uh, UPRT is another kind of career stage progression that pilots of the future, I think, hopefully will all have. But in the meantime, uh, the, uh, the faster swimming fish or the, or the industry leaders are doing it today. And it conveys uh, to the, to the, to the would-be pilot population that you're one of those operators when you're doing it already. Okay, Paul, I'm going to be interested in this next question. Uh, obviously, you have... Uh, a background, a, a captain in the U.S. Coast Guard, oversaw many flying organizations. So what role do you think standardization and CRM crew resource management play in an unanticipated upset event? And do you believe that that adds value to having comprehensive UPRT for all pilots at a particular flight operation? 
Well, standardization you, in the safety world, you can't have too much of it, in my opinion. Uh, the ability to just kind of recognize something for what it is and have a have a response that uh, both the uh, the flying pilot and the and the monitoring pilot understand is coming is uh, is is money in the bank as soon as something starts to go wrong. So it's going to be an enhancement over whatever the performance of the crew would be uh, if they were coming at it kind of cold. Uh, and realistically, if you kind of spread that uh, to multiple pilots so that it's it can be dealt with on a, on a crew resource level, uh, that's yet another order of magnitude higher in terms of the ability to deal with the, with the problem. I mean, obviously, probably um, everybody in the cockpits could have a bit of a startle response if it's a really sudden onset upset. But uh, a person who's trained is going to come clear of that startle response quicker and begin to um, put corrective actions into the situation. Uh, and, and we don't want the other person, if there is another pilot there, to be a passenger any longer than they need to be. So if we can get everybody through that style response quickly, doing the right thing, backing each other up, uh, two heads is definitely better than one. And if they're both on the same page, uh, that's what CRM and standardization do for you in, in normal operations as well as in uh, emergent operations. Yeah, we couldn't agree with you more, Paul, because if an upset occurs, something non-standard has transpired and it's going to be a confusing event. And having those two pilots, if they aren't trained in a standardized way, have a similar response. Is, is not really likely. So uh, we agree with you. Thank you very much, Paul, for taking the time to answer a couple of questions for us and for providing your presentation to us today. And good luck with your uh, speak with your uh, aviation leaders out there uh, later today. Thanks very much. It's been an honor to participate. Have a great day. Welcome to session six of the 2022 UPRT Safety Summit for Professional Pilots Worldwide. I'm Randall Brooks, the Executive Vice President for Flight Operations at Aviation Performance Solutions. And our next speaker is Captain Jeff Wofford, Chief Pilot and Director of Aviation for ComScope and past Chairman of the NBAA Safety Committee. Jeff's going to be talking to us today on UPRT and why it is an essential tool in every pilot's toolbox. Jeff joined the Navy immediately after high school and began his flight training while he was on active duty. After leaving the Navy, Jeff continued to pursuing his ratings, picking up his CFI, his CFII, and began working for a local FBO as chief flight instructor and part 135 charter pilot. In 1984, Jeff went to work for ComScope as a first officer, and by 1994, he became their chief pilot, with his title changing to chief pilot and director of aviation in 1997. Jeff has a BS in aviation management, an NBAA CAM certification, and an airline transport pilot certificate with type ratings in Learjet, Lear 60, Challenger 300, he holds a letter of authorization on the fun side in the Lockheed T-33 and the North American T-28. Jeff has accumulated 13,000 hours accident-free in over 100 different aircraft. Jeff is the most recent past chairman of the NBAA Safety Committee and was the 2013 recipient of the prestigious Eugene Cernan 
Aviation Safety Award. So from somebody with the experience and credentials of Jeff, we should really be interested in what he has to say about why UPRT is important to him and why it should be important to every pilot. If you haven't met Jeff before, you're really going to enjoy listening to him today. Thank you for being with us, Jeff. Well, Randy, thank you so much for the kind introduction. Uh, I'm really honored to be included in this uh, UP, UPRT summit. So the way I look at UPRT, uh, you know, like any specialized task, whether it's building a house or uh, doing brain surgery, you know, it requires uh, some certain specific tools. And, you know, aviation is no different. You know, we've got to make sure as aviators that we have the right tools in our toolbox. And so from my perspective, you know, UPRT uh, is an essential tool. It's no different than uh, practicing V1 cuts or doing single end approaches or, or practice instrument approaches. Uh, you know, it re this requires a certain set of skills, and UPRT is the same way. It'd be like going out and, and practicing an ILS one time and then not doing another one for 10 years and then expecting a good outcome uh, the first time you really have to do it. Uh, so, you know, it probably wouldn't turn out very well. So, you know, our company made the decision about 28 years ago to train twice a year, and we noticed a significant improvement in uh, our proficiency in all aspects, uh, going from basic air work, not only to single engine work and instrument approaches, uh, but we noticed a, a big improvement in our manual flying skills uh, especially rating the steep turn stalls and unusual attitude recovery. You know, so the airplanes that we fly today are very highly automated. And, you know, we fly with the automation engaged most of the time, but, you know, there's a few problems with that. Uh, you know, one is it's easy to get rusty. Uh, you know, it's imperative to maintain our ma manual flying skills as well as understanding the automation. And it's essential not to become dependent upon it. Uh, you got to be prepared to fly the airplane and take over anytime the automation fails or if you have a problem. And over the last few years, we've had multiple examples of uh, LOCI events uh, when the pilots weren't prepared to take over. Uh, you know, and as technology's increased uh, dramatically over the last five decades, you know, more and more items have been added to the recurrent curriculum. And, you know, even in, in 2019, we talked about this at the National Safety Forum uh, at NBA Base. And we had representatives from Fly Safety and CAE point out that in the late 1960s, or since in the late 1960s, we've gone from around 25 specific skills that we had to demonstrate to, to well over 70. And we still do this in the same number of days. So it's really important that we, we inventory our toolbox from time to time and make sure that everything's really important. Uh, and this is especially true of uh, UPRT. And so I, I was very fortunate to uh, start flying at a flight school uh, that had a great training department and offered uh, additional training uh, that was approved by the VA. So I got started in the late seventies and uh, one of the, one of the programs they had was safety aerobatics. And so I enrolled in that while I was working on my commercial. And so I had an opportunity to experience, uh, you know, being upside down and all kind of different uh, uh, scenarios and, uh, over the years, I had multiple opportunities to do aerobatics, so unusual attitudes weren't that unusual to me. So one of the things that really uh, got me started thinking about UPRT or what became known as UPRT was uh, I was at uh, training at the uh, semi-flight uh, for a Learjet recurrent, and I was by myself, and so I was uh, had another pilot assigned to work with me, and uh, we were paired up. And both of us had a lot of experience in the Lears, and uh, the, the week really progressed nicely. Uh, on the last day, we had signed up for what they call uh, advanced maneuvers training. And so we were doing different scenarios uh, with uh, multiple failures and uh, other things to sort of push our skills a little bit. And we finished up doing what they called advanced unusual attitude recovery. And so the scenario that uh, we set up was the instructor pat us on a uh, ILS approach inside the final approach fix, and we were behind a 767. And uh, just inside the final approach fix, we enc we encountered a real hard roll to the right, and the airplane rolled past 90 degrees. And rather than try to counter the roll, I applied full power, pushed, and rolled through, recovered, and then executed a missed approach. Uh, the 
interesting part of it is when we swapped out and the other pilots started working on it, uh, he had issues. And so every time we'd get to the inverted uh, portion, uh, he would start losing altitude and he would pull. And of course, this, the airplane would attempt to do a, a partial split S and then we'd red screen the sim. And he tried unsuccessfully to complete this several times. And each time when he got inverted, he'd pull. Uh, the instructor was having a hard time explaining what he needed to do. And uh, so we were working through this. And so finally, after about the third attempt, I asked the instructor if I could step in and, and help out a little bit. And he was very glad to have me do that. And so I explained real quick that no matter what the airplane was doing, you always point the nose where you want to go. And I said, if you're upside down, that means if you're, if you're wanting to climb, you're going to have to push, not pull. And I said, so let's take a look at this. So we started it again, and I walked him through it and sort of went through him on, with him on the first one. And we successfully completed it. And then he went on to do several by himself. And uh, everything turned out real good. Well, as we debriefed, uh, he went on to explain that he had never been exposed to anything like that, that as he came up in training uh, as a professional pilot, that he had skipped the uh, instructor portion and never, so he never did spend training. Uh, he had never really done anything uh, uh, out of the ordinary as far as unusual attitude recovery. And so being upside down was a completely different experience for him. And it really dawned on me at that time that, you know, we really needed to look at adding some uh, training to our, our department because we had a couple, I had a couple of my guys had done aerobatics, but most of them had not. And so I started looking into different things we could do. And in the meantime, we looked at adding some uh, different training scenarios that we would do in a simulator. We'd pull the sim, we'd take the simulator off uh, motion. And we would do uh, a little more extreme, unusual attitude recoveries, uh, especially uh, involving uh, wake turbulence and things like that that could catch people by surprise. Uh, we also started doing more uh, presentations in-house on aerodynamics as a review. And uh, so we, we started doing uh, a little bit more in our training very early on to try to identify these uh, these discrepancies. Well, then in, in 2007, uh, we bought a new airplane from an OEM, and part of the new aircraft package was several courses. Three of them were academic on human factors and uh, professionalism uh, and some other courses. And then uh, the other one was an on-wing UPRT program. And so we got everybody signed up and was getting ready to go out for the first UPRT program, and uh, the OEM decided to change providers. Really glad they did. Uh, we ended up, uh, it delayed us a little while, but we went out and uh, myself and another pilot were the first ones to go through it. And I was extremely impressed with the training. And so, you know, there's a big misconception about what UPRT is. It's not going out and doing aerobatics. It's, it's learning more about the airplane, how to prevent upsets, and then how to recover if you find yourself in one. Uh, and so the company we went to was extremely professional and, and did a really great job of uh, training us in the ground school and then on the on-wing training. And, and we've continued to go back and do recurrence since then. Uh, at first, we had several of the pilots who were a little anxious about uh, the idea of doing on-wing UPRT. Um, but once we got them out there and put them through the program, they were sold. And then, uh, like I said, I think it's one of these things with UPRT. There's, there's a, a lot of providers out there now, but there's really only a few quality, uh, honest to goodness UPRT providers. There's quite a few people out there that are, uh, providing what they call UPRT. And it's either an aerobatic school or uh, one of the mock air combat schools doing this. And this really is a unique skill set. And you need to have instructors that are, uh, very proficient, not only in flying the airplane, but proficient in how to explain the, the techniques, procedures, and aerodynamic, aerodynamics involved with UPRT. And, and I can't stress this enough that if you're going to do this, if you're going to go uh, to the trouble of including UPRT in your training, then make sure you get the right providers. Uh, so the one thing that happened with us uh, once we started our formal UPRT training, uh, about two weeks after our last pilot completed his initial UPRT, we were in a Lear 31 coming out of Morristown, New Jersey. Uh, and it was one of these just picture perfect days. Uh, we, we were climbing through about flight level 330, 
the uh, winds loft was almost nothing. So we had, we didn't even have a headwind going back home and it was extremely smooth. And we were commenting about it. It was just like flying, uh, flying on glass. And, uh, we're sitting there, everything's looking great. And all of a sudden the airplane rolls, uh, uncommanded, uh, almost all the way to 90 degrees. And, uh, immediately the pilot flying, I was in the right seat, the pilot flying, uh, initiated a UPRT recovery as he was trained. And, uh, uh, we came out of it. We announced uh, to ATC what had happened. And so it turns out that we were climbing out behind a 767. And he was about 10 miles ahead of us and about 4,000 feet higher. And I guess due to the uh, atmospheric conditions, we flew right into his wake. Uh, but like I said, the recovery was just a textbook recovery. And after everything got settled down, our CEO came to the front of the airplane and asked what had happened. And when I explained it, uh, he said, well, great. He said, uh, you did a great job. And I said, well, it wasn't me. It was actually our, our co-pilot. And I told him that Adam had just finished UPRT a few weeks before. And, you know, since then, we've never had any any issue trying to uh, justify UPRT. We Our senior management, our company, uh, is a big believer. And uh, it's one of the things that's always helped out. So the other thing I want to talk about is uh, UPRT and, and what we've done with the NBA Safety Committee. So I joined the Safety Committee in uh, 2014. And I initially started out working with the professionalism working group. And then a short time later, I was asked to take over managing the National Safety Forum. And so one of the things we did for the National Safety Forum for 2018 through 2021 was to identify real specific areas that were causing problems uh, in our industry. And one of those things was loss of control in flight. A few years before this, we realized that we needed to focus uh, on, on several issues. Uh, loss control in flight, runway excursions, and CFIT. And so we formed working groups for each one of those issues. And so we had a really great group that got started with our loss control in flight working group. And uh, they started putting together some really great information. And uh, we got some, we got some great material out on the website. And then we started producing, uh, even, you know, webinars and other material that we were able to put on the MBA site. Uh, to start focusing on loss control in flight. And then uh, as we went into uh, our three-year program with National Facey Forum, uh, loss control in flight maintained or was maintained as one of our focus areas. And we were able to uh, bring a lot of attention uh, to this issue. Um, and even during 2020, when we had to do a virtual safety week, loss control in flight was discussed by several subject matter expert, e experts uh, in an effort to promote UPRT uh, as an important, important part of pilot training. And so it's one of the things we've done in the safety committee is really focus on this. Uh, it continues to remain one of the bigger issues as far as accident causation. And so uh, we, I think little by little, though, we're making a, making a really positive impact on this and we're getting more and more information out there. Well, one of the things, uh, you know, to wrap things up is while loss control in flight does remain a major concern, we got more and more companies are uh, starting to take advantage of UPRT. You know, Part 121 operators are mandated to do it, and uh, and they've included with the training programs. But now several U.S. airlines and several international airlines have taken this a step further and have really put together a comprehensive program. And uh, one of the one of our better UPRT providers uh, leads that it, that effort with them, and. Uh, helping them develop their training programs. And so they go through a program to train the trainers. Um, and even in the Part 91 arena, uh, we've got more and more companies are adding UPRT to their training program. And we do have several world-class UPRT training providers uh, located in this country. Uh, I promise not to advertise for one of them, but I will say that they're in Arizona. Uh, and additionally, flight safety and CAE are incorporating UPRT as part of their additional training. So, you know, it's starting to get out in the forefront of, of what everybody's looking at to improve training. Uh, and really one of the more promising things to come up here lately is the advent of more and more simulators having the capability to be used for UPRT. So this takes care of that uh, anxiety that some people have about jumping into an airplane and going out and doing it on wing. 
And then once they can experience it in a simulator, then they're more likely to try to continue and do the ongoing portion of the training, which I think is essential. I think there's nothing that can replace uh, the see the pants feel, the G loads, the startle factor and everything else that happens uh, is much different on wing than it is in a simulator. Uh, also, we've got some new technologies with virtual reality. Uh, and I think this is going to be a really useful tool. The, the VR sims are a lot less expensive and it allows us to introduce UPRT uh, to more people in many different ways. Uh, a lot of these sims can be configured to be just like the airplanes that the person's flying. Uh, and so I see this as a tremendous bonus where we've got technology helping us. But I think it still matters that we, we take this on and we look at doing this. It's uh, We're making giant strides, but we've still got to get the word out. Uh, we've got to make sure that UPRT becomes something that's focused on. And everybody looks at this as an important skill that they include in their toolbox. So, like I said, we've made a lot of progress. I think UPRT is something that people uh, recognize now as, a, as an issue. And we've had many people in this country step up to the plate and, and put together some really uh, great training programs. And again, I think this is one of the things that's going to make us better. So, uh, again, always check your toolbox. Make sure that you got the right things uh, available when you need them. Thank you. All right, uh, can't wait to talk to Jeff. We've got some interesting questions in queue. And uh, once again, things are lining up well, Jeff. You're the, you're the right man to answer the first question uh, that we're going to take. I know that you were paying close attention to Paul Rattay's, uh presentation earlier where he addressed uh, kind of a broad swath of safety considerations that I know that you had to uh, concern yourself with as well as the uh, when you were the chairman of the NBAA Safety Committee. We have a great question from Muriel Goyer. She is a uh, subject matter expert in human factors. We're pleased that she could join us today. And she asked a great question that I think we should all ask ourselves that might seem like it's a little bit out of the realm of UPRT, but she asks, how do you feel maturity fits in the safety model and how to develop it? What do you, what do you, what would you say, Muriel, uh, Jeff? Well, I think the maturity part of it is extremely important. And, and to be honest, I think Paul Rattay really touched on that very nicely. I think that, uh, uh, you know, being a mentor uh, is a great way to uh, start that process. And I think the other key part is, is setting the right example. You know, Paul talked about that, and I think that's essential. I think one of the things we have to remember is that as we get new people into our flight departments, uh, we're going to have younger, uh, more inexperienced people uh, in the cockpit with us. And the example you set is extremely important. So that means that both pilots have to be more mature. And, uh, you know, I, I've got a sense of humor, but I also know when to keep it in check. And, you know, when I'm in a cockpit, I do try to set a good example. Uh, I'm not going to say a cuss word never leaves my mouth in a cockpit, but I try to limit it. <laughs> uh, and, and so I think a lot of it is how we set an example and how we try to mentor the younger pilots uh, to help them be able to move into the cockpit and to be a, you know be efficient, effective uh, parts of the equation. Yeah, I was going to try and answer this uh, question seriously and not uh, relate it to uh, you know the the your your maturity in in this uh, aspect. But <laughs> I think the the interesting thing about her Marielle's question is there are ways that we have as an industry that we can accelerate uh, what we would call maturity. And there's a, uh, it'd be great to talk with her uh, because there's a couple of different ways that we can mm -hmm. interpret um, maturity and, and how she might be ask, uh, looking at it when she asks the questions. I know that threat and error management is uh, one thing that uh, is advocated having pilots earlier in their career try and identify risks and how to mitigate those things. And I've heard the concept of threat and error management uh, explained as just what a 20-year captain accumulates mm -hmm. over the process of their career, um, just kind of distilled and, and combined. And I think that we can kind of look 
at upset prevention recovery training uh, in a similar way. We're trying to provide skills that you know may actually never be um, gained to proficiency in the normal envelope because they're mm -hmm. sort of different skill sets and, um, and try and provide those to pilots earlier in their career or before they need them. And that aspect of competency uh, brings us to our next question from Carl Davis. He says, feels like competency is what we're after. How we get the IPs and the line pilots competent is the stretch goal now. So in your conversation, Jeff, you uh, discussed a little bit how we're trying to instill competency at the Part 142 training centers. How do you think we ought to be assessing um, competency in the upset domain amongst regular line pilots? Do you have any ideas for us there? Yeah, so I think... Let me let me begin with this. I think uh, to, to dovetail into the first question, you know, threat and error management, risk mitigation, whatever you want to call it, uh, is an essential part of uh, being a good pilot. And if we introduce this early, it makes a big difference. And if we start talking about competencies, uh, you know, I think UPRT is one of these tools that is really essential because it does teach you manual flying skills. You know, UPRT is not re revolving around pushing a button to, to correct a problem. And so you've got to have certain competencies. And I think the other thing that happens is when you go out and do uh, a formal UPRT program, not only are you gaining more confidence, but you, you gain these essential skills in manual handling, manual handling for the airplane. And so I think it's one of the things that dovetails nicely into the first part where we're looking at not only identifying these threat and error management processes, but we're providing pilots with a way to uh, develop the skills and abilities and to help build confidence, which is also going to help build maturity, which is also going to help, uh, you know, them as they go further in their career. And so I think all this works together. I think uh, uh, allowing people to have access to more than just the standard training. And I, and I think the biggest thing we've got to do is get pilots out of the mindset of just going to training and checking block, you know, checks and boxes. Uh, you know, if you finish up at, at whether you're going to any of the training providers, if you get finished with your sim session, there's still 20 minutes left in the simulator. Don't get out. I mean, there's a tendency to go, yep, I'm done. Thank God. Let me get out of the simulator. No, you really need to sit back and, and uh, take that time to go out and try something else. So, hey, I, I really didn't like the way I did my single engine miss, or I really am not. I didn't like the way I did my steep turns or my unusual attitude recovery. Uh, you know, you take that additional time to, to make yourself more competent. And then I think the, the simple fact that including UPRT into a training regimen is, in a, is really going to improve things all the way around. Uh, again, it's a, it's a really nice way and a safe way to improve not only confidence, but your manual handling skills for the airplane. So, Jeff, one of the things I like about the uh, Q&A session is we get some surprises and some curveballs. So I got one for you uh, right. that, that I know uh, how we feel about it, but I know that you have uh, participated in, in on-aircraft UPRT as well as uh, some of the simulator sessions that you've described. So Piers Hebert uh, asks us, so which is best, simulator UPRT first, then airplane? or airplane first, then simulator. So let's just get your opinion of that, and then I can uh, chime in with our view. And uh, I see BJ has joined us, so he may have something to say here for as well. But you get to go first, Jeff. Okay, so I think it depends on the person. So we had a situation where a couple of my guys were a little reticent about uh, getting in an extra 300 and, and going up and going upside down. And so for somebody that's nervous, uh, I think the first step would be in a simulator. Uh, I think for somebody that's, uh, you know, that's excited about it, I, you know, put them in the airplane first. I think that uh, a combination of simulator and on-wing training is is a great way to go. But I think that if you have to pick one or the other, on-wing is the way to go. Uh, I think there's nothing that can replace the, uh, the kinesthetic feel uh, in the aircraft. Uh, and I've had people ask me, say, well, how does flying an extra 300 uh, do an UPRT in it compared to flying a, you know, a Challenger or any other larger jet? Uh, it's the same process. The, the extra happens a lot quicker. Well, guess what? In, in the bigger airplane, you got a little more time to mess with it. So uh, all-wing is essential. 
but I think that simulator based training is, is a useful tool. And again, it's a way to introduce somebody to UPRT and without the, uh, the fear that can accommodate, that can be associated with it. So I think they work hand in hand. I think that, uh, uh, a combined program is is the best way to go, but I think if you have to pick one or the other, absolutely on wing training. All right, so there's the perspective from a, a flight department uh, manager, BJ. What uh, what's your feeling on Paris' uh, question? Well, I just jumped in to say hi to Jeff actually, since he was here, and I haven't talked to him for a little while. So thanks, Jeff, for being here. Great to see you. Absolutely. It's uh, you know, we learned the hard way many years ago, I think back in 2008 of what to do first on aircraft or simulation. So we did a test. We did the exact same program and simulator, exact same program and airplane. Then we switched the groups. And what we found was the folks that were trained in, in the airplane first could directly and immediately transfer their skills into the next category of airplane, complex, high performance, multi-engine business jet. The folks that got trained in the simulator then actually went into the aircraft were psychophysiologically incapacitated to even get access to their skill set. <laughs> it took them it took them several flights to be able to be effective, which is why in our presentation earlier we talked about how the hardest puzzle to solve here is the training of the human being to be resilient in crisis to be able to get access mm -hmm. to their skill set. So, guys, I just came in to say hi, but I, I'm happy to share my opinion. Jeff, uh, great having you here, and I'll, I'll leave it to you guys. Okay, so uh, you guys, can wrap up. I know we're getting into the time. Good to see you, Jeff. Always good to see you. Yeah, we're we're about out of time, Jeff. My perspective is it's interesting. I had addressed this question uh, when I was uh, director of customer training at Eclipse, and we were doing side by side upset training in an L thirty nine and flying the L, uh, the Eclipse uh, uh, in in the aircraft as well as the simulator. And what we uh, learned kind of paralleled what APS was learning at the same time, which is if you do the on aircraft stuff first, then you take that physiological, psychophysiological, as BJ said, experience with you into the simulator, you can't forget it. You can't unlearn it. Absolutely. You pointed out a, a very, very uh, valid concern that we have with a lot of folks that are nervous about things and they can get some of the basics down in the simulator and show them how uh, different it is from what they might think. It's certainly not aerobatics. It all has to be transferable. Well, Jeff, uh, as BJ said, I mean, everybody likes working with you. That's why G BJ had to, to come in and say hi. So thank you very much uh, again for taking the time and uh, hope you'll uh, join us uh, here in an, after our next session for our wrap up. Uh, but we're gonna be going to our good friend, John Cox next. He's got some very important uh, words for us. So, so long for now, Jeff. Take care, I'll see you later. It is my great honor and privilege to introduce our final speaker for the event today, Captain John Cox with Safety Operating Systems, where he is President and CEO. The title of John's presentation is What the Industry is Doing About Loss of Control in Flight is Not Working. John has an MBA in Aviation Management from Daniel Webb College. He's a graduate of the U.S. Navy Postgraduate School Aviation Safety Command Program. He's an ISBAO Auditor and an IOSA Auditor. 
From a flying background standpoint, John is a highly experienced airline, corporate, and general aviation pilot with over 14,000 hours, 10,000 of which are in command of air carriers. He held positions as instructor, check pilot, and test pilot, and he's type rated on Airbus, Boeing, Fokker, and Citation fleet. John has an extensive safety and industry background. He is the former Executive Air Safety Chairman for the Airline Pilots Association, or ALPA. He's the recipient of the Sir James Martin Award, ALPA's Air Safety Award, and U.S. Airways Safety Achievement Award. He's also been an accident investigator working with the NTSB on numerous major airline accidents. John is also very active in the news where he's been showcased on ABC, NBC, CBS, CNN, MSNBC, C-SPAN, Aviation Week, Time Magazine, and many more. He appears as an expert on the television programs Air Disasters and Why Planes Crash. He's a fellow at the Royal Aeronautical Society, and his most recent paper is relevant to today's topic, Airplane Upset Recovery Training History, Core Concepts and Mitigation. And you may see John appearing in USA Today, where he authors a column titled Ask the Captain. I personally know John for over 20 years. He's just a great guy, fantastic leader, and I consider him a mentor and a friend. With all that, John, over to you to wrap up today's event. I appreciate the opportunity to be part of the 2022 summit. It's, it's an important subject of loss of control, and having been in the safety business a pretty good while now, it's an, one that concerns me primarily because we've not made the progress on it as we have in other areas of accident prevention. So I'd like to talk a little bit about where we are and then open the discussion on where we need to go. From the beginning, uh, loss of control in flight. I'm going to run some statistics uh, for you just to give you an idea of the seriousness of this particular type of accident. About 46% of fatalities in uh, airliner type accidents, these are Boeing numbers, uh, are loss of control in flight. It's almost half. We find that this has stayed pretty much flat over the last number of years. Control flight into terrain was a major accident type with fatalities. Technology was able to pretty well reduce that significantly. But as we go forward and we, we have the discussion about what's the priority in reducing numbers of fatalities, we've got to put loss of control in flight first. If you look um, at some of the Flight Safety Foundation numbers for 2021, loss of control accidents are 10% of the accident types. Um, but as you see, they're the, the deadliest. They, they have the greatest number of, uh, of fatalities. So we don't see this type of accident all that frequently, but when we do, um, the results are typically a worst case scenario. Uh, ICAO, if we turn to them and you look at uh, the overview of accidents that they did, um, and I just I pulled out uh, three charts here from their ICAO safety report in 2022, uh, you can see two losses of loss of control in flights and 72 fatalities. And uh, this it, it stands alone as far as severity goes. Uh, you can see here um, the, the total accidents by occurrence category and uh, loss of control in flight, you can see. So there's two of them, but the total number of fatalities here, 72 and the next highest being control flight into terrain at 32. Um, but the total number of accidents was the same. So the, uh, the number of control flight into terrain accidents has gone down. And the severity uh, has also diminished somewhat. Looking at a little bit further into the ICAO data, uh, you can see that about 30% of the fatalities uh, are control flight into terrain. We're almost 70% uh, in this data set and about 50% of the accidents, but about 70%, that's almost three quarters. Um, so 
two thirds to three quarters of the total number of fatalities uh, in this data set for loss of control in flight. NBAA, uh, looking at the business aircraft. Over the last 10 years, 40% um, of the general aviation, commercial aviation fatal accidents have occurred because pilots lost control of the airplane. And that's an unacceptable high number to me. I, I think we can do better than that. More importantly, I think we have to do better than that. I think the expectation of safety of our passengers uh, and the regulators, the media, the politicians, all those that wa oversee our industry, I think they have that expectation as well. National Transportation Safety Board. Um, since 2008, almost 3,000 people have died in fixed-wing general aviation accidents, and about half of those involve loss of control. That's a lot. That's a lot. And this is as far back as 2015 um, when Member Wiener made these comments. Uh, they have frequently had loss of control in flight on their most wanted list. Uh, we see continual efforts, but I'm going to submit to you that those efforts have not been as satisfactory as we had hoped. And I would also submit to you we need to be thinking about how to get better results for the aviators that come through our training programs that sit in our, uh, in our airplanes on a day in, day out basis. If you pull up something even as like Wikipedia, there are 18 events um, of airliner accidents caused by stalls. About half of the loss of control accidents are stall related. We have an awful lot of protection built into the airplanes to prevent stalls, yet we see this accident type continue. A number of the airlines are utilizing enhanced simulators uh, with enhanced envelopes to show um, post G brake aerodynamic characteristics, and that's a step in the right direction because for many, many, many years, uh, the idea that we would only fly it up to the approach to stall, the activation of the stall warning system, and correct any, uh, any flight path deviation then. It's just not the real world because in some cases, we're going to see airplanes that are beyond critical angle of attack that are in fact stalled. And with high performance airplanes, and I've, I've I've stalled some pretty high performance airplanes in my career. Um, that, that point at which flow separation occurs in the, the G brake can be very pronounced, very aggressive, and require very um, well planned and executed stall recovery techniques. And it needs to happen quickly because things can get out of hand very quickly. And then we end up with another loss of control event. Probably two of the better known ones uh, recently. Uh, one happened, and the, in, the investigation is not finalized, but uh, one happened outside of Gillespie Field near San Diego uh, just after last Christmas. Uh, a Lear 35A on a circling approach, and um, it appears that this is a loss of control event from the flight path. Why? Lightly loaded, uh, the weather was not good, but why? What happened here? What, what led this crew to make a, uh, to let the airplane get in the condition it did? One that's a little bit better known and has been the, uh, in the AOPA training cycle along with a number of others is another Lear 35A that was, uh, on circling the land at Teterboro. A lot of factors come into play here, late turns, experience of uh, the first officer, but they let the airplane get slow, and this is according to NTSB, which I agree with in this case. Um, they let the airplane get slow, and uh, when, it, when it stalled, uh, recovery was not possible due to their proximity to the ground. So these are two highly visible accidents that really 
give us a, a indication that we have not solved this loss of control event yet. We have not yet found all of the techniques, all of the training, all of the, the technology that can lower this sort of accident. And I submit to you, we should. It, this should be the priority. This needs to be the priority. When you look at, um, this is just in, in 2020, starting in 2020 and going through uh, 2022, you can see there's a large number of these. They're all loss of control events. It's too many. And I think we can do better. There's 28 loss of control in flight accidents in 31 months. If you put that on average, we're accepting a loss of control accident every 34 days. I submit to you, we can do better than that. That is an unacceptable number in my view. I think the professionals that we have uh, can mentor the ladies and gentlemen that are entering our industry and reduce those numbers significantly. The target that I would set, I think we can cut them in half. And I think we can do it in three probably three years, three to four years. There's a massive pilot hiring uh, that's underway around the world right now. That says that these pilots that are new hires are going to go through new hire training. They're going to go through initial training. And in that initial training, we can set the groundwork to improve their skill set to where we do not have a loss of control accident every 34 days. I think we can run it out to 60 days very quickly, 90 days in pretty short order. But it takes a commitment from all of us. It can't be just those of us in the safety world. It's got to include the training, the management, the pilots themselves, and a, uh, a request demand for training in upset recovery and prevention. One of the things that I hear from time to time is we should be focused only on prevention. Certainly prevention is essential, but history shows us that some crews are going to end up in position where we need, there will need the recovery skills. And we as an industry, I think, owe it to those crew members to ensure that they have those skills. The IATA Global Database. 60, uh, shows that over the last 10 years, 2009 through 2018, this is the most current I could find, 64 loss of control accidents were identified over a 10-year period. 94% involved fatalities to passengers and or crew. Loss of control results in more fatalities than any other accident category. Roughly 2,500 out of about 4,000. That number is too high. It also has one of the lowest survivability rates. So no matter what data set you use, be it for general aviation, business aviation, airline, commercial uh, aviation, all of the data shows us the same thing. It's showing us that we have too many loss of control accidents resulting in too many fatalities. That, ladies and gentlemen, in my view, says that it should be our leading priority going forward. The loss of control, things we can do, um, increase awareness to precursors, obviously, if we can intervene earlier. Taking definite action, and from experience, I'll tell you that that, uh, that action may need to be aggressive, and in the event of a high-altitude stall, it may require some patience to build enough energy into the airplane to be able to return to level flight. But it's increased awareness of the flight crews. That needs to be uh, a remedial part of every recurrent. Enhanced in monitoring of airplane flight path. And flight path management, certainly automation can play a piece in it. But the monitoring of the flight path is a pilot function. And to know what areas where you, the vulnerabilities exist for the highest likelihood 
of an upset. These are all things that we can do. And mode awareness. Since we have had the automated airplanes, mode awareness has been a, a, a real challenge. And that is continues today. But to the emphasis on watching the flight mode enunciator and ensuring that the crews understand the mode and the implications of that mode uh, throughout the flight. Loss of control accidents are always almost always catastrophic. 94% of the accidents analyzed involve fatalities. This is too much. This is too much. If you look, and this is uh, recent data, if you look at the um, IATA data from 2022, you can see the loss of control in flight. That's the number of fatalities. That number we can and should reduce by no less than half. And then at a point later downstream, we'll half make half of that. But we can do this, but it takes all of us in the industry. And I think it's time. Loss of control accidents, um, they have been trending down somewhat. Um, it looks like right now we're going to have a good year in 2022. Uh, I say that uh, with, with fingers crossed. But um, we had a very good year in, in 2015. The following year, we did not have a good year. So as we slowly improve this, we need to be careful that we don't consider one good year, such as 2015 or even potentially 2022, uh, as a definition of success. Only after we have gotten the, the fatality rate down significantly over a period of time can we say that our mitigations are in fact working. How many people know this document, the Upset Recovery uh, Training Aid, Revision 2? A lot of people worked on this, and I submit to you that this document, although written for large airplanes, can has a lot of information for high-performance smaller aircraft as well. If you don't know this document, I would encourage it. For those of you in training, I would encourage that you use this, uh, this good document and share it with your crews. It's got a lot of good information in it. A lot of people put a lot of time in it. And I think that it can be a good source of information. So I come back to my question. Is a loss of control accident every 34 days acceptable? Certainly technology has a place in this. It can help us reduce control. Uh, it helped us reduce control flight into terrain. It can help us as well. But is there better technology available? Are we recruiting those that create these sorts of technology and then utilizing them to our best advantage. Same is true of training. Training has made us better, but it needs to make us even more so. We need to train more pilots in upset prevention and recovery. We can increase focus across the industry. If we can increase the focus on the leading cause of fatalities, we can, in fact, improve aviation safety, and that's the goal for all of us. If you take one thing away today, I hope it is this. If we do nothing, we'll have the same results. Or if you do what you've always done, you'll get what you've always got. Henry Ford said that, and it is totally applicable to us today. If we do nothing or we do the same things we're doing now, we will not have the effect that we need. Can we reduce loss of control in flight? Yeah. History says we can if we choose to. And I hope, in fact, that we do. I'd like to thank you for the opportunity uh, to be a part and close out the Safety Summit. Hopefully, uh, there's some things in there that will uh, garner discussion. I'm certainly available uh, if any of you would like to have further discussion on it. But it takes all of us. It's not just those of us in aviation safety. It takes the trainers. It takes the management. It takes the pilots. It takes every one of us to lower the single leading cause of fatalities. And thank you very much.
All right, everybody, I'm here with Captain John Cox. He's going to explain to us with his busy travel schedule where he's having to meet with us to do his question and answer because we knew he wasn't going to be available on the day of the show. John, what are you, what are you doing today? Well, Randy, I'm out in, at the, in Los Angeles with the University of Southern California where I'm one of the instructors in their safety management school system school. And so uh, I'm teaching classes today. So unfortunately, I couldn't be there with you in person, but I appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to take a couple of questions from you uh, after the presentation that I made earlier. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that's how you know you have a real expert there in such demand that uh, they're constantly on the move. So let's go ahead and begin with our first question, John. It says, given the fact that loss of control in flight has remained the leading cause of fatalities for decades, why do you think that regulators have not required further changes to training to fix the problem? I think the regulators struggle with this. The, the cost of acquiring even a private pilot's license has skyrocketed over the years. And I think that the, uh, the regulators are, are struggling with what is essential piloting skills to show um, competence to, to fly an airplane and I think ever so slowly that the, the need for upset recovery is, uh, has increased. And I think over time, we'll see it included in the, certainly the commercial uh, and ATP type licenses. Uh, for the private license, I think that'll be a little bit further downstream. But if you look back in history, we used to require uh, stall spins, and now we only require that for CFIs. I think that hopefully uh, in airplane upset recovery training can be molded into a, a pilot curriculum and improve things. Yeah, it, it makes sense when it's required at the part 121 level, why would we wait until that point to try and introduce those skills? So let's take it our look at our second question. It says that while the statistics regarding loss of control in flight are pretty unambiguous, and you use data from multiple sources to, to show us that in your presentation, why do you think that the loss of control in flight threat is so underappreciated by so many pilots? I think there's a multitude of reasons. One, in the professional arena, the 121 uh, and professional pilot arena, the availability of simulator time is, is very limited. The curriculums are completely full. And so trying to put another module of training in, I think really challenges the, the training organizations. And consequently, they've pushed back on it. Uh, I think that pilots, training pilots is, is a very expensive, both in time and in dollars. And so the, the feeling is, well, we'll teach it to them in, a, in an academic way, and that way they can apply it. Uh, and should an event occur, and not very many events occur anyway. So I, I think that there's been a little bit of false security in it. Lastly, uh, I think pilots overestimate their abilities to cope with uh, a full-blown upset. Uh, they, they think that they will react better than history shows that some crews do. We are talking about a, a low percentage here of pilots that, one, face a full-blown upset, and two, act inappropriately. So the, when you look at it about how many pilots do we need to train, well, we need to train all of them to make sure we get that small subset, but it's hard to justify in some uh, managers' minds the additional expense when we, it only comes up you know, one or maybe even twice a year. Yeah, it's interesting in your answer, John, you point to the fact that, you know, there's a certain compartmentalization. Uh, IKEA, when they looked at this, were able to look at it systemically, and they made suggestions about when various aspects of UPRT should be included. Um, but other than the regulatory agencies, there's nobody that's overseeing that big picture. And speaking of the big picture, we're going to end with a, a big question for you, and it's certainly something that you pointed to. It says, since there has been so little change in the last 10 years, what do you feel could motivate, motivate improved efforts in UPRT going forward? I think a combination of a lot of the alphabet groups, uh, including the regulators, to get together and push, make it uh, 
not even a regulatory push, but an industry-wide informational push on the criticality of upset recovery prevention, uh, prevention and, and recovery training. And I think if you do that and you, you put a really bright spotlight on it and you, you ask the insurance companies, you pressure the insurance companies to, to incorporate premium deductions uh, or adjustments for people who not only go through uh, upset recovery training once, but keep a currency because it is a perishable skill. And if they do that, then that will help offset some of the cost of the training. But one of the things that, that always amazes me is the friends of mine and colleagues of mine that go through the training almost unanimously say it's the best training they've been through. And so there is a, a strong drive within the pilot community of wanting this training, of recognizing its value. And I think now it's up to us as an industry on a larger scale as operators, as regulators, as insurers, uh, as training organizations to put a spotlight on this. It's time. Well, that's certainly something you've done through your presentation. It's something that we have attempted to do through this entire UPRT Safety Summit today. We want to thank you for your efforts in helping to move that uh, ball forward and uh, increase that spotlight of awareness. Good luck with your work there at USC, John, and thank you for answering a few questions for us. Thank you, Randy. Uh, always good to see you. Welcome back, everybody. We're going to uh, start plugging in our speakers into our wrap-up session. Uh, there's Captain Philip Adrian joining us. Uh, thank you. There's Captain Clark Otter McNeese, and uh, we're uh, We have Jeff Wofford back with us, and we're pleased that Captain Atika Tsui could join us from way in Fiji. Thank you for getting up uh, so early this morning, Atika. Nice for everybody to get a chance to see you. And uh, BJ, I think you've queued up some of the questions that came in at the end of the event. And uh, if 
we want to car start running through a couple of those, I think that would give some great mm -hmm. fodder for the, the guest panel that we have assembled here. Yeah, no, there's some great ones here, Randy. There's a couple. And I think that one of the challenges we saw today when we're beholden to LinkedIn is, is wasn't flowing very well. So I don't know if we're going to use LinkedIn Live next year for the Safety Summit. But anyway, let's uh, let's jump in here with the first question. And I wanted to bring it up because it was asked a little while ago. And how is VR utilized in upset recovery training? And I think that's something that we can uniquely talk about since we've integrated VR into our solution. And, and obviously there's numerous ways to do it. Uh, and I'll start on it and then we can open up for a little bit of discussion. So the, the unique part of the way APS approaches, and I, I'm just gonna speak from our perspective, is that you know in this one location in a short period of days between two and a half and three and a half days, depending on the solution, is you get preparatory online training through distance learning, you get live academic training, on aircraft piston, all attitude training, on aircraft jet, all attitude training. If you're if you're a jet pilot, advanced simulation in the class and category of airplane that you are operating in. And what we we'll use VR for, uh, even though we would agree that type specific simulation is the best platform to go and get type specific training. What we do is we use VR as, as an environmental transfer skill. We take folks at the end of their program is while they're here in that type compressed solution, and we get them into their very own airplane, applying their techniques and their strategies in their aircraft. So it really enhances the been there, seen that value. They were just through a program with high fidelity and maneuvering, high fidelity and spatial disorientation, high fidelity and startle surprise training. And now they get to, as they leave for about 30 minutes, they get to see all these upset events in their aircraft, which is great. And, and that is done from a single pilot standpoint. But if they're a crewed operator, we address crew UPRT, pilot flying, pilot monitoring in the advanced simulator right here on site and compress it over that time frame. We've just seen substantial benefit on compressing the time over a short period of time because the transfer of skill is very powerful as long as you mitigate negative training and negative transfer of, of scale and training it's critical so it's, it really maximizes the value of the solution so that's all i had to say on that randy i don't want to dominate the, the time we have yeah that's fine i think that uh, what we've learned and what we've heard today is that there's a variety of platforms and maximizing the benefits of them independently and joining them together provides the best overall solutions so let's go ahead and uh, pick another uh, question that we've uh, got in our queue there, BJ, and see, uh, I know we had one that was uh, related to spins. That's a, a subject that comes up pretty regularly. Um, and, you know, spins are obviously a big question in the uh, general aviation community, but uh, most uh, transport category aircraft are not spinnable. Keith Wolzinger asks the question, should spin training be included in upset prevention recovery training or as a pilot certification requirement? This has been debated endlessly. The view here at APS is that it's the overall picture of stall spin escalation. And so uh, even for pilots that are flying aircraft that can't be recoverable, it's part of showing them the entire story. Uh, do any of our other speakers have any thoughts on uh, the benefits of spin training overall in pilot training curriculum? Yeah, you're, yeah, Randy, I'd, I'd like to put in my two cents worth or maybe nickels worth. Uh, so having come at this from two directions. So, you know, as I, as I said in my presentation, I was exposed to aerobatics fairly early in my in my training, including spins. And then as a flight instructor who taught flight instructors, I did spin training for the flight instructor candidates. Uh, and then, of course, then uh, with with APS, who that's that mysterious flight school in Arizona that I promised not to advertise for. Uh, when, when I went to APS to, to you know, get introduced to UPRT, uh, you know, spin training is an essential part of it. I mean, when you get with Otter and have him put you in a skidded stall that results in a fairly impressive spin immediately, uh, uh, yeah, you learn a few things. So I, I think that spin training is essential. Uh, from the instructor standpoint, when I was teaching instructors, uh, the reaction I would get when uh, you put this 152 into an incipient spin uh, well, was pretty impressive. I mean, some of them, it was a, a grin, some of them, it was a grimace, and some of them, it was just pure, uh, I mean, they were scared. 
Uh, and so I think that when somebody fears something, uh, it's a very negative impact. And I think mm-hmm. by getting the appropriate training, uh, you can reduce that part of it. And, and so, you know, when you're afraid of something, it really does hinder your ability to deal with it. And so I think that, uh, like anything else, that uh, exposure and training makes a big difference in how we handle these situations. Can I add something there, Randy? Because I'd like to hear from Philip, actually. Atika, we're going to definitely get to you. So thanks for getting up so early, for sure. Appreciate having you here. So uh, one thing that ICAO, and I don't think the ARC did, and neither did EOS, was required develop spin training. Philip, do you want to talk about that? Maybe it was a bridge too far in the allowed time, or what was the philosophy around that. Do you want to address that a little bit? And then maybe I can take a look at it from the from the APS side. Of it. Yeah, so so you're correct. Uh, it, it was one of the things that that was discussed extensively. Um, a, a lot of uh, the experience brought into the arena uh, identified that spin training had had many benefits. Um, I'm not saying it doesn't, but requiring it uh, when your ultimate goal of the uh, of the training is to produce pilots that will fly commercial air transport uh, airplanes that are not spinnable is is not an, a, a value added. Uh, I, I think Jeff said it earlier and, and many others, uh, we had to be accurate with our requirements. That doesn't mean that it, it shouldn't be added when time permits. Uh, I've, I've been in the airplane with Otter as well and, and, and you know, I've spinned many airplanes, uh, and and it, it gives you a certain understanding of what happens when your airplane is stalled and you have rudder input. Um, that that could actually lead to a positive transfer of learning how not to use the rudder in a transport airplane. So there are learning uh, objectives that can be achieved from that, but we chose not to put it into a requirement because of the uh, the objectives that we meant to uh, achieve with both uh, the FAA, uh, ICAO, and EASA. So yeah, Philip, I think I would add to that. One thing, for example, like the United Aviate Academy program that we do, they have the three hours of on-aircraft training, and the way we integrate spin training is to complete that stall spin escalation from an unintended slow flight to approach to stall to stall to incipient spin to spin just to complete the metal model, but the intent of it is not to go out and spin their a 737, right? Or even their Cirrus. It's for them to understand the escalation and improve their awareness and prevention intervention early and correctly. So I think we're all aligned in that. Sorry, over yeah, to you. Correct, and, and maybe if I may add, BJ, um, we, we sometimes talk about spin training and uh, 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 you know training for all the things, but what we're looking at is the understanding of the development uh, and we don't we do not do startle training, for example, to just do startle training. We do it so that people get awareness of what startle is or what a spin is, how it developed, and how you can prevent that at many different stages. it's it's the the reason and philosophy of the Swiss cheese model. Uh, you know, if you know what's coming, uh, why don't you close one of those holes up and make sure that you're aware of it before it actually happens? All right, before we go to our next question, BJ, I'd like to take just a second for a public service announcement. Uh, Our friend Brian Burks with Alaska Airlines uh, put a question in there uh, about what are your thoughts on the potential benefits of hosting the Global UPRT Summit that allows the sharing of effective academics, type-specific UPRT maneuver sets for simulators and proven standards for instructors and program oversight? Well, this isn't a theoretical question because we had such a UPRT summit. As uh, as Captain Burks knows, uh, United Airlines hosted the first one <clears throat> that was held back in 2019, and it was a, a great success. I think as we've seen today, there is a lot more to this subject than we can address in the four hours that have been devoted to it here. Uh, that uh, global summit has been put off for two years because of the COVID situation, uh, but they're planning on getting it together next May in Seattle live. So any of you listeners, uh, it is uh, going to be uh, advertised once they get the date set down, but we think that's a great way to try and uh, share ideas. Uh, BJ, I'd like to look for a question that... uh, you go ahead. If you don't mind, I wouldn't mind addressing the question. So, Philip and Etika, what are your thoughts on the value of a global summit? Do you, do you feel that that, I don't know if either of you attended the one by United Airlines, but do you, do you feel like that is the value that Brian's hoping for to get the air carriers together and probably even their academies 
to talk about how to produce the futures pilots to really transfer that low experience into high aviation safety? Maybe starting with you, Philip, then go over to Atika. And you guys are referring to an in-person summit, not online. Yeah, cor correct, uh, uh, Otter. Um, there is always benefit of getting, getting experts in the room. What we cannot forget, though, is that um, we cannot leave those that are not in the room behind and thinking that we're uh, that, that we're only making everybody better. Um, we have to prevent. We saw that at low card. We see that at many regulatory uh, impacts as well. That the, the the best get better and and others get left behind. So while I truly uh, applaud this initiative and and we need to do it, we also need to bring it out to the organizations and and rather than do it in a centralized location and 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 and, and pass ourselves on the shoulder and say look how good we're doing we need to make sure that it comes out to the airlines to the training organizations all over the world and that was our intent with ICAO as well to not go over the top and, and and make the best get better but to make this available for everybody because this is a worldwide issue and we need to look for a worldwide solution and, you know, one of the things, Philip, I was just at the Bombardier Safety Stand Down last week presenting, and what they do is they, they record and stream the events, not only live, but on demand. So when they're done much like this event that, you know, the folks can around the world at their leisure and a time that works for them to be able to watch those events. So I totally agree. I think that was very, very good input. Atika, what are your thoughts on a, on a global summit that Brian's referring to? Hi guys. Um, yeah, I think it's it's uh, an important thing to have. Um, the, but at the same time, it shouldn't be overwhelming for uh, people who are not uh, familiar with UPRT. Because um, I think the first time that I heard about UPRT was at an uh, event where I actually met Captain Philip for the first time. And that's the first time that we were looking into UPRT. Um, and so there, were, there was just a lot of overwhelming information. And so I think that's why it took us uh, so long to, uh, it took, took us about two years to actually get our, our foot on the ground and, and run with the idea. So it's a good idea, but at the same time, it shouldn't be overwhelming where, uh, where the, uh, the organizations don't get uh, too much information. Uh, we just need to know uh the importance uh of uprt and uh and how an organization can uh, kick off a uprt program and if you don't mind uh, randy jeff you're in the process of putting get part five sms in the united states is coming out and i know that you're heavily involved in trying to produce a simplified version of sms how do you see an analogy to uprt approaching it to atika's point of starting small but well structured and on target and growing it from that point forward and then yeah i think that's the key to it i think you've got to start small and uh i think sometimes we jump in uh into the deep end before we test the waters and uh, so i think one of the things is to start with a with a simple program and to uh you know basically awaken some awareness in everybody uh and so I think we've got a, a good concept. If you look at part 121 versus 91 in the United States for the last decade, uh, with the airlines, they've got a very robust program. And I'm not aware of a loss control in flight event for the U.S. airlines since Colgan. And then by comparison with part 91, you, you only have to go about a month, two months, and you've got good examples. Uh, so... I think we've got a concept where we know that pr the process works if we teach people properly. But I think the key to it is, is starting with a manageable program uh, and not trying to reinvent the wheel. There's a lot of great resources available. And I am a big believer in technology. And I think that anything is better than nothing. And I mean, what you did at base, taking your VR sim to uh, Orlando and letting people sit down and see what UPRT is all about, I think something as simple as that, as that makes a big difference because the problem is is that sometimes people tend to distance themselves a little bit from reality and pilots typically are pretty optimistic they're not going to find themselves in that situation and so they sort, they sort of have a they turn a blind eye toward it and so I think anything we can do in a simple fashion to get things started is going to make a difference 
if it looks overly complicated, uh, then people are going to avoid it until it's mandated. Yeah, if, if, if I may add to that, that, that is exactly what we tried to achieve. Um, quite often, if we put a whole elephant in front of somebody, it, it's just too big. Uh, we need to eat it one spoon at a time. Um, that that's one one of the things why I identified in my presentation as well. Some of the things, awareness, vigilance, uh, knowledge, and applied knowledge, those are small steps into it. But perfect is the enemy of good enough. And and quite often you see here uh, d during these conferences, but but also uh, when when I talk to individual organizations that they're saying, well, we don't have the right package for our full flight simulator, and until that time, we're not doing anything. That is the wrong approach. There are so many steps in between and you need to start small. You can start in a uh, in, 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 in a uh, an academic environment. You can start on airplane training. You can start in, in our simulators that are type specific and learn that. Um, just because you do not have the last piece in place that you might need or you might want, uh, it is not a reason to not start. Uh, let's get this going because, you know, we are going into the second half of this. And as John accurately said, it is not acceptable that we're continuing to have these statistics. So let's not be technology dependent or restricted. And, and, and you know, perfect is the enemy of good enough. Let's get started and let's make sure we do it right. And we do it right now. You're on mute, Randy. Randy, you're on mute. Tell you what, I'm going to leave this one. So, guys, here's one of the questions that we missed earlier. Uh, not that it wasn't addressed to some extent, but I think maybe we'll have a short discussion on this. We have three more questions left with about 10 minutes. I'll keep watching. And this one is, how can the instructors train with their students the startle effect during simulator sessions, especially when they have the syllabus to work during the training? How do you, in other words, how do you fit it in and how do you accomplish startle uh, which both of them can sometimes be very difficult. So why don't we start with, uh, um, Philip, you want to comment on that? And we'll go to Atika. I addressed it in one of the questions that Randy asked me after my presentation. It is the uh, creation of a, a distraction uh, that works. Um, we are in a highly regulated situation where the sessions must be very similar to, to the others. So distraction, uh, you know, non-related uh, things going on, whether it's an ATC instruction, whether it's something, but we have to be careful that we're not looking for technological solutions. I saw somewhere in the, uh, in, in the question and answers uh, that, uh, you know, we should have a button where we can get a stall warning. You know, that, that, that is not the solution. We need to make sure that we stay true to the airplane. We stay true to the, uh, the, the, the feasibility of these kind of things and make sure that we're not uh, going into the, the old fashioned negative learning uh, where, where, you know, can you still fly it when a wing fell off and the other engine is only working half of the time and can you still bring it in? That is not where we want to go. So we need to make sure that we distract but that we do in, in a positive way and that we always have the learning objectives to work towards. Otter, do you want to maybe talk about that a little bit? Because you haven't had a chance to chat about oh, the concept of startle and simulation. Is it A, possible, and B, if it is, how would you accomplish it? Well, as, I, as someone who's got thousands of hours training UPRT in airplanes and simulators, uh, we all just have to uh, just realize that the simulator is not the tool to use to replicate good startle or surprise. It's just, it's just not. We can do a certain amount uh, at a certain level, but this is where the on-aircraft training can really come into play. Uh, I do uh, totally agree with Philip. Uh, we've got, we're highly regulated, we're compressed, uh, and, the, and the simulator is just not the best environment uh, or tool to use for addressing that human factors issue so and i would add that you know the and i've seen this happen uh, unfortunately in a number of situations the drive to try to generate startle can have the unintended consequence of trading tremendous negative training and what results right creating like a 90 knot wind shear and different things like that or locking one of the controls like we saw in some of the unfortunate accidents of the past which was a standard in uprt in simulation to try to drive an outcome that unfortunately was the wrong outcome at the end of the day. So I think there's a lot to, to learn there. Randy, what would you like next? I'll pull it up for you. 
I kind of like that we have a couple of questions regarding simulator use. One uh, is the, the, the use of a, an extended aerodynamic flight envelope. There was a second question about the use of motion. And so, you know, I think we, we've heard many examples of the contribution of on-aircraft training. Um, and the, the biggest thing that's ne necessary in the use of the simulator is the simulator instructor because a, prop, a properly trained simulator instructor can use an, an, not an enhanced envelope, just a regular good level D simulator and knows how to stay within the confines of the validated training envelope of that simulator. And a lot of our use of the simulator, certainly for CRM, for low visibility, low altitude situations, but really as a procedures trainer um, and holistically, if you have the opportunity to do on aircraft training, it shows the transfer of skills introduced on aircraft into a domain that is closer to what uh, pilots are flying at work. But, uh, you know, it, it is part of the, the qualification of an instructor to be a real UPRT instructor to see that the simulator device that they are using needs to be, the tool needs to be used in sort of a different way in teaching upset prevention recovery training, because rather than remaining in the normal envelope where the vast majority of line pilot training is done, you're using it around the edges, but you have to be concentrating on getting the aircraft back into the safe heart of the envelope. And I'll leave that up to other people to address what we have here. I think this is going towards unreliable airspeed, talking about the uh, power plus attitude equals performance, which was originally a military approach to training, but it's been well accepted in civilian aviation. So I guess it'd be a question of uh, how do we integrate, and quite honestly, unreliable airspeed is integrated into an effective UPRT program. It's a necessary requirement. And then, you know, teaching basic attitude instrument flight, I mean, I'm gonna actually pull something that uh, Philip had said way back in one of the rulemaking committees is the fact that when somebody arrives at an air carrier, they shouldn't be needing basic upset prevention and recovery training. They should be already prepared to then do a transfer of skill into that class and type of airplane. So in this, my brief response while you all are thinking about what to say would be when somebody arrives at UPRT, they should already be instrument trained. We're transferring it to the all attitude environment. Fundamentally, the principles apply whether it's VFR, IFR, night IMC, whatever it might be, this, the strategy and the, and the sequence of events remains the same because they're really solving and diagnosing an aerodynamic condition. I think the other thing that we see in this question, BJ, is the holistic flying concept that's been discussed today. There aren't these hard edges or boundaries. The concept of pitch plus power equals performance is just as valid in unreliable airspeeds as it is in stabilizing the flight path in upset recovery. So, you know, introducing these into pilots at the licensing stage, just as you said, has them showing up down the line uh, better equipped to deal with uh, upset situations. Philip, Jeff, and Otter, you guys have anything to add? Yeah, I'll add that um, on the Flight Safety Foundation identified unreliable airspeed as one of the main issues that need to be addressed. So when I was still at Boeing, I know we worked uh, very hard on, on providing guidance for the, uh, for the pilots worldwide with procedures, uh, memory items, uh, Airbus and, and other OEMs did the same to make sure that there's a standardized uh, approach to deal with this. And, and indeed it's, it's power and attitude, uh, it leads to performance. On, on modern day airplanes with their uh, varying weights, uh, CGs, uh, altitude ranges and stuff like that, it sounds a little bit simpler than it actually is, but there, there's a lot of work being done and has been done on this. So it's, uh, it, it's important and this comes back to don't look at the tool, look at the task. Uh, what is the task that you want to uh, achieve? It is to get the airplane back into as much as possible the center of the envelope. You do not need motion for that. You can do it on a fixed base simulator. You need a crew approach for this, you, but you need to understand, and that's what in my presentation as well is important. You need to understand how your airplane is talking to you, what you need to do to get it back to that center of the envelope, and whether that's pitch and power, whether that's following the OEM guidance on, uh, on, on, on the nose high or nose low recoveries, those kind of things. I'll leave to the to the OEMs to to provide the correct guidance for those airframes, but it is 
simply not necessarily to always have this on motion. Motion uh, effects, and that, that's, uh, that, that's the first question that Randy asked, motion effects are temporary, and um, some OEMs actually recommend training off motion because of the incorrect cues that can be uh, translated as well. So that, that's a little bit of combination between both questions. Jeff, thoughts? Yeah, so I, I think the, the first comment you made was important uh, that, you know, when you, when you go to UPRT, especially when you're transitioning into an airline environment or going into business aviation or, or corporate aviation specifically, uh, you expect somebody to already have their instrument skills and you should be teaching that. But I think by the same token, we go back to some of these concepts we've talked about, you know, today where uh, talking about UPRT is an essential part of even in primary training, that if we introduce uh, UPRT into, some, into someone's training regimen when they're going through their private training, uh, and then further when they get into instrument, then we're developing a, uh, a system that's designed to produce a better pilot. So, you know, we're going to build a strong foundation when they're going through their private and their instrument training, and that we should improve these skills, uh, you know, as they start working on their commercial and then working toward their ATP and in top ratings. So by the time somebody gets into a large aircraft, they've got this foundation that's already a firm foundation with all the support. And then when you do start throwing uh, other things at them, that they've got that skill set to, to address it and be able to deal with it. Well, be, I know we've, I know we've got a hard stop at the uh, end of the hour. Any uh, parting words you'd like to, to share with our guests? Final thoughts. Why don't we go around the room with our guests. Atika, anything you'd like to share in general to the industry as we wrap up? And we will get cut off if we don't end at the four-hour mark. Go ahead, sir. Uh, very briefly, I think the data is clear on, uh, on uh, the statistics on fatalities. And um, I think for each of our, one of us that has influence in organizations, I think they could step to convince uh, the organization to get into UPRT because uh, we don't want to be part of the statistic. And uh, overall, it's just a simple way to go for it. Okay, we'll need to wrap up at the 59.30, Randy. Finish with Philip, and I don't want to cut you off, Philip, so I want to give you some time. Yeah, real quick, uh, I think back to 2004 when I met Gene Cernan for the first time, Gene told me that in aviation, being good is not good enough. And so I think that as professional pilots, we need to strive to be the best we can be, and that means that we constantly try to sharpen the sword. We try to make ourselves better, and I think UPRT is a great, uh, a great way to sharpen that sword. Cool. Philip, 10 seconds. Give us your words of wisdom. It's going to transform everybody. Start small, start right, start now. Excellent. Okay, everybody. Thank you so much for being here, Randy. Thank you for hosting this event. I know it's a busy time. Appreciate it. I, everybody's going to benefit from the safety of this event. So really uh, can't say thank you enough. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.